Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. <laughs> Something funny. <laughs> no, 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 nothing. Uh, you know, it's just that both those belts look exactly the same to me. You know, I'm still learning about all this stuff. and uh... This stuff? Oh, okay, I see. You think this has nothing to do with you. You go to your closet and you select, I don't know, that lumpy blue sweater, for instance, because you're trying to tell the world that you take yourself too seriously to care about what you put on your back. But what you don't know is that sweater is not just blue. It's not turquoise. It's not lapis. lapis. It's actually cerulean. And you're also blithely unaware of the fact that in 2002, Oscar de la Renta did a collection of cerulean gowns. And then I think it was Yves Saint Laurent, wasn't it, who showed cerulean military jackets. I think we need a jacket here. And then cerulean quickly showed up in the collections of eight different designers. And then it uh, filtered down through the department stores and then trickled on to, down to some tragic casual corner where you no doubt fished it out of some clearance bin. However, that blue represents millions of dollars and countless jobs and it's Sort of comical how you think that you've made a choice that exempts you from the fashion industry when, in fact, you're wearing the sweater that was selected for you by the people in this room from a pile of podcast. <laughs> podcast? No, oh, podcast. Okay. Are you Meryl Streep? Yes. He's Meryl Streep. No, I know, just in real life. I mean, that was really oh, good. Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> that was pretty good. Well, I've seen this movie a number of times. Hello, everybody. My name's Griffin Newman. I'm David Sims. You, you, you messed up on lapis, but I was proud of you. You just went through it. A lapis was not the best choice. <laughs> no, no, no. What do you wear? You're wearing blue right now. <laughs> That's kind of lapis. It's almost mm -hmm. yeah. kind of a lapis. <laughs> so this is a very special episode we have here. The podcast, Kablin Check. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, I'm looking at lapis right now, and sure. it does. It, it corresponds. It's quite similar. We're kind yeah. of sort of context, and this is a, a podcast. <laughs> about About birthstones. About birthstones. <laughs> Uh, this is a podcast about uh, filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their career and are issued a series of blank checks to make whatever they want. Sometimes those checks clear, sometimes they bounce. Maybe, usually. Great. Sure. Mm -hmm. But we're in between miniseries now. Now, people think they know what happens in between yeah. miniseries. I've gotten texts, people being like, oh, what's Ben's choice this time? Oh, but, You oh, don't know. Oh, producer Ben's going to choose a movie, right? The Ben Deucer is going to choose something. <laughs> producer Ben is going to choose something. <laughs> You're going to have a producer Ben choice. Yeah, I mean, what am I going to pick? The meat lover's going to make a choice. The fart detective's right. going to make a choice. Yep. The poet laureate's going to make a choice. Dirt bike Benny's going to make a choice. The tiebreaker's going to make a choice. Birthday Benny is oh going to make God, a choice. Jesus yeah. <laughs> I'm going to pick something. Whose choice is it? It's the poet laureate. It's right. the choice of the finest film critic. That's what they, you guys say about He's me. He's doing all the names. You know about this? No, I don't. Yeah, he it's Peeper's the choice. Yeah. The Peeper's choice, He's baby. He's given Ben a lot of names over the years. <sighs> Years we've been doing this podcast. And look, yeah. the man who gets those choices has graduated to a series of titles over the course of different miniseries. <laughs> I guess he has. That's true. Do yeah. you well, go ahead. Producer Ben Kenobi's choice, Kylo Ben's mm. choice, Ben Knight Shyamalan's yeah. choice, Ben Sate's choice, Say Benny Thing's choice, mm. Ailey Ben's with the dollar signs choice. Yep. Right. Warhaz's choice. Yeah. And, and and you know what? I'm gonna call the shot now. Ooh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Purdue Bane's choice. Yeah. Nice. Purdue Bane. I like it. Yeah. Pretty Urbane. Feels right. Yeah. yeah. No, I know. I'm into it. But we're throwing you off our scent this week. Yep. We're doing After all that Ben talk. After all that Ben talk, Ben, you don't got ben, the no, choice. I don't get Take to a pick seat. this time. <laughs> I'm sitting. We've teased yeah, this episode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Came up in our mailbag episode and people demanded it. Mm -hmm. So we're instituting a new tradition. Sure. It's family night here <laughs> on Blank Check with Griffin and David. <laughs> yep. He blew out the mic just a little bit. No, no, it's fine. He's fine. He's the, fine. The first of what may be a, a, a trilogy of family episodes. Oh. Not not consecutive. No, we'll we'll do them. We're, we're, they're just in the they're Each in of the us hopper. is going to get to have a family night. Yeah. A bring your family member to podcast day. Yeah. Yeah. Who are you bringing? Well, I don't have any brothers or sisters. <laughs> I was going to say, I think it's your dad. I feel like your dad's the one who's... Who looms oh over God. the podcast? Imagine Ben's dad oh, on this podcast. I would love. Yeah, we'll make it happen. Eventually. It would have to be yeah. some like hard sci-fi movie. No, no, loves. we pick something that he hates, and he'll just get mad. <laughs> no, we do Clifford again. Leave your poor yeah. dad alone. <laughs> no, we do it to him. We got him. All right, okay, okay. Introduce your uh, but today. You course. might have heard her. You know her best from the introduction of this podcast. Mm -hmm. She is one of my best friends. <laughs> she is not one of the two friends. No, 
but she is one of my best friends. I'm blowing up today on this mic. She is my sister, so we go way back. Way back. Yeah, all the way back. All the way back. You you remember her birth, I assume? Uh, I do. Yeah. I'll, I'll get to that in one second. Sure. Uh, and uh, she she also is a, a chef and a, a, flu, a food blogger. I was about to say flood. A food, a food, a food blogger. Remember that game Snood? Writer. Yeah, great game. Yeah. I still have it on my computer. Me too. Sorry, I'm waving to, uh, yeah. Uh, Romley, Romley Newman, ladies and gentlemen. My sister Romley Newman is here with, with the first ever Rom's Choice. Rom's Choice. And you want to tell us what movie we're talking about today? We are talking about The Devil Wears Prada. Now, I called this shot for you because in our mailbag episode, someone said you get invoked a lot in this podcast. Yep. They said if Romley was ever on the show, Romley well, Newman... Formerly of the Endurance. Uh, you're going to have to. Oh, of course. Right. Uh, Interstellar. And Interstellar. Oh, I, oh, I know. With your name. And we just oh, talked about that movie. So mm-hmm. people will find that very funny. Yeah, people are <laughs> pausing the podcast Losing. to reattach their sides after yes. they split. They have split. Yes. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they're buying some tiger balm for their ribs because they have been <laughs> aggressively tickled. <laughs> some icy hot. Yeah, 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 uh, and and those slap knees. Mm-hmm. Um, I said I thought you would pick Devil Wears Prada, and then people said I would listen to that episode, and then I asked you, "Is that a fair and, choice for and you?" And the thing is that it it is. I have a list of movies that I think are good, really good movies. That sure. when people ask me what my favorite movie is, I pull from that list. Mm-hmm. You've like constructed a list that you feel like it's very curated. It's very You'll curated. It I'm not saying it's disingenuous. No, but you have no. a list that's like. This is the 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 my cinematic world right. that I want to convey to so people. Like, it, it, yeah. If you want to know what I think are good movies, you can look at this list. But if we're talking about my favorite movies, right. very, which I think which is are a very different very different, I agree. Um, it's Devil Wears Prada. Ratatouille definitely makes it in there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's honestly a lot of uh, cartoon like uh, animated, animated movies, a lot of Pixar movies. Yeah, unsurprisingly, you might you listeners might be surprised genes. to hear. That, that a sibling of mine who is nine years younger grew up watching a lot of Pixar movies. <laughs> and the crazy when when Frozen came out, um, I became obsessed with it. Mm. Really obsessed, like unhealthily you, like, obsessed really with it. Disney at all, and that's why because yeah. I was like, "What the hell is this? This yeah. is the best thing I've ever seen." And people were like, I, "You know, it's not one of Disney's best movies." And sure. I was like, yeah. "Are all of Disney's movies you like this?" You didn't Pixar. give Romilly the Disney. I was kind of deprived experience? of a child. It was huh. it was Pixar and Muppets. Yeah. No, I mean I know yeah. what you like. Yeah. yeah. So I have a silly little boy. I have a Miss Piggy and a Kermit the Frog uh, stuffed animal in mm-hmm. my room. Sure. Mm-hmm. And I only have seen Pixar movies. Hmm. That's not true. But but that was your main. I, I, sure. I I've never seen The Lion King. That's. that's I've never surprising. seen Little Mermaid. Sure. Yeah, you haven't seen a lot. No. Of them. When yeah. were you born, Romilly? Not nineteen ninety eight. Right. You know. So you are born yeah. after the Renaissance. You're quote Mulan. Unquote. So the, the bloom Mulan. was off the rose. Uh. Well, sure. I mean, but yeah. Came of age during the dead, the the exactly the, that's what the I'm blank saying. Period right, Mulan Disney. was right. like the last. I have never seen Mulan. Right, Mulan's ninety nine or ninety eight. Then Tarzan's ninety nine, and that's I have the seen last Tarzan. big. Yeah. Is After there that, any... they enter a fallow period. Oh, oh, Lilo and Stitch was the one you grew up with, but that oh, was I the love, oddball. But that's, I love Lilo. That's, that's okay. always that's yeah. always been a weird one. You know that it exists uh, when it does, is and it was also funny. like I think it was animated in France. It was like they didn't yeah. think they were going to give it a big release because it yeah. was the same year as it is a weird. I was going to say Treasure you, Planet. You guys are highly disrespecting the Emperor's New Groove, which is one of my favorite. Never seen. I don't know if you're oh, see that one's Love great. That movie. No, but but this is the point from because Tarzan's the last like traditional big Disney movie, and then the uh, ones yes. that are good from that point on are Emperor's are New Groove funny. and Lilo and. Uh, yeah. Lilo and Stitch. Why am I mispronouncing everything? Lilo. I flew back from Australia yesterday. I have not slept much. Uh, David Smiley. Smile. Um, those two movies were atypical Disney films. They no, were like right. breaking the you're mold. Right. And but that's also what was happening at that point in Disney. I just right. like the idea movies. that you had to curate. You were like, okay, Lilo and Stitch is weird enough. We can show it to Romilly. Mm. That was also the new one. I can't. We. I took you to see the other ones. You didn't like any of the rest of them. What other? One? Around that time, you like saw. You took her to see Brother Bear. I don't know about Brother Bear. I definitely took you to see Treasure Planet, which you don't remember. No, you don't. would have been very young for Treasure Planet. Um, Some people like Treasure Planet. Like it's people fine. who are younger than me, they have more of a fondness. Uh, I, I have, here's a movie you have no memory of having seen, but I distinctly remember taking you to see it opening weekend. Home on the Range, which was the sure. cow one with Cows. Roseanne Barr. No idea. Mm-hmm. That was the last traditionally animated yeah, one before they, they, they went closed to CGI. Up shop. Yeah. And then it's the CGI ones, Chicken Little, which sucks. Yeah, that's a bad I one. I have seen 
Chicken. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I've seen all of these movies with you. Don't Meet remember. the Robinsons. Meet the Robinsons, which is okay. Sure. Bolt. But, it's a dog. I saw that by myself. I no, <laughs> I saw that was. with you. I saw that by myself. You might have seen that. I saw that by myself. Okay. Leave leave it leave it be. Because that was before you had Scruffy when you wanted a dog. I yeah, I was obsessed. Right. I want a dog. Um, but Devil Wears Prada. Just just okay. to speak to blank check is perfect for us because we're never going to do a David Frankel exactly. miniseries. Exactly. This guy lucked into this movie and he is a garbage man. And he's so been dining whole, out on it for 15 years. Really, now, he 10 really years, has. 10 years, the whole time years, I was watching the movie, I was wondering who, who he was. He's he's a guy. Okay. He, he's sure a guy. So he made one movie. Uh, he made a couple his first movies. Movie, his first movie before Devil Wears Prada. This was only his second film. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, he makes one movie and yes, he does a lot right. of TV. Yeah, he he made uh, Miami Rhapsody. Right. This is his first movie. Sarah Jessica Parker, Mia Farrow. Uh, sort of classic pre-Sex in the City Sarah Jessica Parker joint. Yeah. yeah, where it was kind of like not a hit. <laughs> right. you, know, you know what I mean? But Honey like Moon people were like, she's out there. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he makes this one movie, and then the weird thing that happens in his career is he does a lot of TV. Yeah, he made a pilot called Dear Diary. So that's what I was going to say. Starring B.B. Newer. And you know what happens to this pilot, right? Uh, oh, it, it I wins didn't. the Oscar. It was turned into a short film. They make a 22-minute pilot. It isn't picked up. They submit it to the Oscars as a short film, and it wins. Huh. Which is weird. I think so that's the only time it's ever So he won an Oscar. Happened. So he won an Oscar. Sure. Why don't people do that more? I don't know. Yeah. The only other thing I can think of that's similar to that is Mulholland Drive, which was a pilot that he shot more for. Right. But that didn't win no short film Oscar. So he Absolutely is not. the Oscar award-winning director. He is an Devil Academy Award product. winner. Right. Huh. So then he does a bunch of TV. He does a bunch of Band of Brothers, From the Earth to the Moon. Sure. He does a bunch sure. of Sex and City, probably because he's rolling with SJP, still from his Miami Rhapsody days. And then he gets this, mm-hmm. and this movie's humongous. It, it is, and it much bigger than uh, Anna Wintour said that it was going to go straight to video. She Everyone was wrong. thought this. Like, they like wrote it off. He also did two uh, entourages, which is probably how Grenier gets rolled into this yeah. one. I, yeah, unfortunately. Uh, he did. <laughs> oh, boy, is it. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying. Yeah, a lot of TV. Yeah. And then since then, he's been dining out on this because he has one other hit. Marley and Me. Marley and Me. Yeah. Ooh. Which does very well. But does then, do well, but kind of like, who remembers Marley? Um, it was probably the first movie to ever make me cry. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, excuse what Excuse me, there that's for. not true because you sobbed during Big Fish. That is true. This is these, these two guys. I've been hearing a lot of Griffin stories already off mic. Um, but he has a co- bad because we should have had them all on. I know. Yeah. It, big problem. Yep. We had a couple. He had a couple huge flops. Big year. Uh, Big Year was a mad. That's the um, which I think is actually kind of the, solid. The I watched bird on a watching plane. movie yeah. with uh, Owen Jack Wilson, Black. Steve yeah. Martin, Jack Black, but it's also got like Rashida Jones and Jim I, Parsons I and Brian Dennehy. I, I've never Diane seen Diane Weist. It's this crazy stacked cast, right? And then you've got Hope Springs, the Meryl Streep, Tommy Lee Jones, Steve, Steve Carell. Carell sex therapy movie. That's a movie I didn't see, which no. says a lot that you didn't see a Meryl comedy because you are all about Meryl comedy. Now I've never seen Hope Springs. It also has its fans. Really? Because yeah. I was about to say that movie doesn't exist. Well, it kind of, people definitely don't remember that it exists, but you know Bunheads? Remember the show Bunheads? Yes. There's this <laughs> running joke in the show Bunheads that one of the teen boys at school loves that movie, and then in the either the finale or one of the last episodes, he does like a whole monologue of Tommy Lee Jones's from it that is amazing. Did you watch amazing. a lot of Bunheads? I watched every episode of Bunhead. <laughs> he watched as much Bunheads as a person <laughs> yeah, can exactly. watch. Exactly. I did everything. I gave them, I ate everything they gave me. Uh... So I've always thought, like, man, I should – is that just a gag or, like, is there something to Hope Springs? But I've never uh... – I watched an interview with Steve Carell recently where he invoked working with Meryl Streep. And I was like, when did he work with Meryl? <laughs> like, I remember oh, every yeah. movie ever right. made. And I had to work <laughs> to remember that Hope Springs existed. Also, when that movie was announced, I believe it was Mike Nichols was going to direct it. Yeah. And it was still Streep, but it was going to be Jeff Bridges, hot off the Oscar – and Philip Seymour Hoffman playing the therapist. God, imagine Jeff, like Marvel yeah. mouth Jeff Bridges. Right, which is kind of, uh, I mean, uh. kissing cousins with cowboy grump Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, no, sure, I mean, whatever. Uh, but then that became a movie that that just didn't go anywhere. A rare, unnominated Meryl Streep year. Yes, uh, it largely ignored. And then he makes One Chance. Which? Let's not forget, One Chance. James Corden vehicle. About a uh, unattractive British opera singer who isn't Susan Boyle. Yeah, no, he was uh, was on a reality show. Paul Potts, yes, he was right. an earlier British 
Susan Boyle type who it was like he Inspiring gets on stage story. He's got and he's really teeth. overweight right. and he looks weird and people are like, ooh, and then he like sings beautifully and everyone's like, oh, you know, and then he was famous for a year but and the, they made a movie about him. The big thing that came out of that movie was that was a weird Weinstein movie. We've talked about the Weinstein shuffle right, in the past, one of those the ones Tulip that, Fever, yes. where it wasn't released for like three or four years. Even after James Corden started doing the late show, the late, late show, whatever the fuck it's called, they uh, still late, hadn't released it. Mm-hmm. And then it finally got released on like six screens and David Frankel sued Harvey Weinstein because part of his contract was that he took a deferred salary. Mm. Uh, he How do lowered you know this? his quote because this was a story. Okay. He lowered his quote um, okay. because he wanted to make the film. Sure. And he agreed to take a larger profit a participation. Passion. Passion, passion project. project, but part of that was that there were contractual agreements into how wide the release of the film had to be, and Weinstein had broken those agreements. Hmm. Dave Frankel's quote, which he had lowered, do you know how much it was? I, I shudder to hear it. I believe it was eight million dollars. It's a lot of money for a guy who was dining out on one movie. But this this movie, The Devil Wears Prada, was a it sticks. hit beyond hits. Yes, it sticks. Was there one other flop yet? Well, and then last year he released Collateral Beauty. Um. Well, right. That's his most recent effort, which was a flop, right? Yes. It was like a critical flop, but it was also it. a it commercial flop. It was a big flop. commercial flop. Okay. So he's had two hit films, but he comes out of nowhere. We'll never cover him again on this podcast. No. No. We would never will. No. Sorry, David Frankel. Uh, the, his IMDb picture is him with Marley or a Marley oh, type great. dog. Great. That's exactly what I pictured him to look like. Yeah. No, sure. I mean, he looks like a nice man. Did he have one other film? What was the thing right after Devil Wears Prada? Was there something? Marley and Me. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that we've covered all of it. We've, we've done it all. We've let's done the whole let's... Frankel filmography. He did not direct Marley and Me, The Puppy Years, the prequel to Marley and Me. Where I think Marley talks, right? It sounds great. Okay. Can't wait to watch that. Uh, stars Donnelly Rhodes. I don't know who that is. Now, you said, like, this is probably your favorite movie in terms of, like, this was kind of your toy story. This is the one right. you watched obsessively. There is one movie you watched more than this. I would argue there's one movie you have seen more frequently. Because how many times do you think you've seen Devil Wears Prada? Well, it was interesting as I was watching it last night. I I, I have a thing where I, I I have a hard time watching movies more than once. Sure. Right. Because um, I was like an avid rewatcher. You right. were not. You don't I have can't, movies you it, like it, watch it, over and over. No. no. It, I get no thrill out of it. Because for me, it's all about the first experience. Sure. And you're and excited. Even, most of your favorite movies you've seen two times, three times max. I know. And that's the thing. And I have a friend who's always quoting movies. Yeah. And so she, she was like, oh, and... She listed some movie that's one of my favorite movies, and I just had no recollection of anything that happened in it. I just remembered the feeling of loving it. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. But I, I it's really very experienced. Yeah, it's, it's very. Um, but I, I don't, I don't rewatch movies. Uh, this movie I could probably watch eight hundred times, mm-hmm. enjoy it every time. It's the exception to the rule. It's the exception to the rule. And yes. you, you probably watched it like fifteen times within the couple of years after it came out. Do you, you burn that DVD? Sure, sure. Yeah. Yes, I have a DVD of it. Mm-hmm. I think Griffin bought it for me. I did for Christmas. You're Very welcome. Nice. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of what the movie I've seen. There's one movie you've seen more than this, and I know because I have seen it. It is probably number. Oh, five I know what it is on the list of movies I have seen most because of how obsessively you watched it. It came out three years before Devil Wears Prada. It was kind of eclipsed by Devil Wears Prada, but this was unquestionably your favorite movie until Devil Wears Prada came out, until you were eight years old. What? Daddy Daycare. Oh. You watched He's talked about this movie a lot shit. on the podcast. No one has ever watched a movie more than you watched <laughs> Devil, Daddy Daycare, which is especially astonishing because you don't rewatch movies. Right. And you as a kid were not – like most kids have their like movies yeah, they, they just watch, watch over movie. and over again. Yeah, right. I would not like watch that. things once and love it and never want to see it again. You watched I Daycare 800 times. Yeah, that really was my favorite movie. That's – I forgot. And that, you knew Did you drop it, line it like at a certain point? Well, probably when this came out, honestly. You still would – it became like, okay, I'll only watch I Daycare twice a year after <laughs> Devil Wears Prada. Right, because you would have been pretty young when this movie came out. I was. You, yeah, were, eight you were eight or nine years old. Sure. But yeah. I was eight going on 40 at the time. And like Miranda Priestly was what I wanted to be in life. Mm-hmm. R- Romley's like goal in life is essentially to be, I, I don't want to speak for you here, but the joke we always make in our family is like, your like most idealistic, like dream life through a movie character, the way like little boys like dream of being Indiana Jones. Rom always wanted to be Meryl Streep and it's complicated. Right. Like, sure. I think Rom's sure. fancy situation is, like, in between marriages, remodeling the kitchen. <laughs> right? I 
cannot wait to be 50. Well, you described yourself yes. to me as when you were a little kid as a 50 year old. Right. Woman. Yeah. She really um, was. Yeah. But yeah. from like, sometimes I get stressed. And I'm like, oh, am I, like, am I doing enough so that when I'm 50, like, I'll have this perfect life? And I, I'm, my biggest fear in You're life. You're 19 is, years old now. Let's state that. Right. My biggest yeah. fear in life is to get to 50 and be really disappointed because, and most women dread turning 50. You're angry sure, for 50. Sure, sure. 50. I mean, I think right. 50. On, I'm going to just kill it. You're going to kill it. Yeah. Because now it's like, okay, you're, so little, you're just kind of like, I'm really at the just watch waiting. Right and now. everyone's like, your teenage years, your early 20s, like those are the times you'll never get them back. I'm like, I, I would gladly give them up to uh, be making croissants in my kitchen like and Ron, dancing. Mom kind of acted like a teenager when she was like four. Sure. So by the time, so she by the time was she's like eight, eight right, right? She's basically a middle aged woman. Right. And and this movie was a big activator because this starts the sort of Meryl comedy genre, which becomes like your big genre because right. it's all these roles that like are how you want to. But also this movie, I'd argue, life. was very helpful to me because I watched it and I decided that I wanted to be one, a boss, mm -hmm. a literal boss, not yes. just a boss in life. And not yep. a girl boss because she no, fucked up. No, because girl boss, not girl a boss feminist messed up. piece yeah. of shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But number two is that I wanted to be – well, I guess this goes with number one. But I just wanted to be in charge and do things for myself. Uh -huh. And I greatly sympathize with Miranda Priestly, yeah. as you do. One of the movie's successes in my opinion. And so it, it, it was a big motivator. So I think – Sure. Sure. I love that most people – the lesson of this movie is like you got to find a balance between work and life. No. Like, for this, it was like, you know what, Romley? Just be cutthroat. <laughs> screw people over. Get, get what you top. want. And throw a bunch of designer codes on your assistant's desk. She throws them so well. I know. It's just so amazing. Well. But this is the thing. This is a uh, not romantic comedy. At all. And with the sort of dressing of one. Right. And so people misinterpreted I think it as that. That's another comedy. reason why yeah. I really like it is in, I love romantic comedies. Yeah. But I'm always like, oh, the guy sucks. Like, let's just move on. Like, let's show the girl being badass. Sure. This is like, there's no, there's no excess. You like the trappings of romantic comedy. Like, you like the aesthetics. You like, dare I say it, the patina of romantic comedy. Favorite word. Y you may say that. Right? Yes. Yeah, you can say it. But but the romance stuff you're not as into. No. This movie is like all the stuff you like in romantic comedies minus the stuff where they talk to, like, some, some lumpy guy. Well, I would right. say this movie's biggest failings are the scenes where they have lumpy guys. Like, the lumpy guys are the most superfluous part of this movie. Yeah, right. and that's yes. what I was thinking last night is that. They bring them. it down a little bit. They but, do. But the, it's kind of the perfect amount. Like it's the, A, A, it kind of works in the movie's favor that the guys are lumpy. They're, they're super they lumpy. They need to be lumpy. Right. They need to be lumpy. And B, there's not too much of them. No, there's not. I just, I could have done with almost none of them. But yes. Agreed. Yes. But I, I agree. They're, 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 uh, there's a dust. I think the guys make it a little bit more human. Uh, yeah. And a, yeah. And a little bit more realistic because if not, it, you're just kind of stuck in this runway world. You, you need know, a little yeah, bit of need, the outside because there's no, press, like, you yeah. need the friends. You need just a little yes. bit to bring it down. Rich Sumner's very good in this. <laughs> Harry Crane. He's very good. Oh, I good know who this. you're talking about. He's, he's her, you still haven't watched Mad Men. But he's he, amazing on Mad Men. And he plays the friend uh, her, in her friend group who, like, is impressed with fashion. Oh, I love him. He's Which great. is so insane in this movie. Can you imagine a man knowing I have, about I know, fashion? And, I know. Ben I is trying to go that. into fashion. Ben is trying well, to go I'm into fashion. Into so it. <laughs> But you want to move into it as like a full career thing. I know oh, you're into sure. it as a lifestyle. But, right, right. But every time he says something, everyone's like, oh, how do you know that? And yeah. I yeah. don't. Yeah. That, it's a little much. That she would not have. <laughs> let shaking. me just it's say. Very there's a few right. things. I just look. hate that. I don't know. It's like this movie was like so made for mainstream audiences, yeah. obviously. So yeah. it's like sort of trying to get people, you know, it's like. You wouldn't do that even level, now, though. But still, like, fuck that, that shit. That they make Come a on. joke out no, of the straight no. guy, like, why do you but, know all this? They, but that yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't even happen. No, that would not happen. Right. No, it you know, it's, it's actually funny how quickly things like that uh, change. Yes. Like, that joke would just kind of be flat, like, where he's like, well, I'm kind of a girl. And it's like, all right, you know, like, right. you've heard of Vogue? I mean, Runway is Vogue. But she would know who Anna Wintour is. That's, my, that's one of my only problems, where yes. she's like, who's Miranda Priestly? Like, you know who, that line if you've is, been to journalism school, right, you would yes, have heard okay. of her. That line is also stupid because there's just no way someone like that would go into a job interview no. having no idea who the boss was. Google She's still exists at that point. Like, she would look it up. Yeah. yeah. She, she could Google Demarchier. She can yeah. Google Miranda right. Priestly. Gosh. Okay. So we've gotten all our criticisms of the movie out of the way. The rest of the movie is great. More, but I mean, it's a great movie. I've <laughs> yeah. seen it a bunch of times. Yeah. Like, and uh, almost just by accident. It's just such an easy movie to watch. I probably, I've probably seen it like, 
or probably six or seven times. Did you see it in theaters, Romilly? Well, I was going to ask. Griffin. I saw it in theaters with you, which was either your second or third. Time. I don't remember seeing it for the first time. Okay, sure. So I was wondering if you were there. It's like I, a dream. You just sort of like. But now it's, it's just it's part of my you've life. Always known. Devil I remember was you proud took of. me to it, and it was a big deal that you want to go see something in theaters again. Okay. Um, sure. Because I I was that was the summer where I went away to Paris for like a month, which okay. I'm probably about I to do again. Probably saw to it. hide away from the world. I yeah. probably saw it with our mom. I believe so. You saw it with Dauphin. And then. Because that's the kind of movie right. she'd be like, Rom, do you want to see this movie? And I'd be like, yes, right. please. It's about fashion. It's about fashion. You were into Hathaway. I was definitely into Hathaway. I probably walked into it a little bit unknowingly, saw it, and was like, oh my God, this changed my life. Griff, right. you need to see this movie. And I remember seeing it with you a second or third time. It had already been out for like a month or two at that point. So I knew it was a big hit. And I was like, I'm sure it's going to be like fine. And I sat there and watched you watching it. And it was like those stories that kids tell about like seeing Star Wars for the first time. Sure. Like, it was your second or third time in the theater, and you were, like, leaning forward all the way with your eyes wide open as if it was, like, special effects that were stunning you. Like, the whole world of this movie was, like, totally uh, entrancing to you. And then and then you got on DVD and you watched it incessantly, incessantly, right. incessantly. Um, and, yeah, and then this – Meryl kind of became your, like, on-screen avatar in a right. lot of ways. And it became such a thing in my life that Griffin would sometimes have to say, like, you're doing the Miranda Priestly face. Mm. Oh, I forgot about that. You, yeah. She used to do it all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All and the time. So it, it wasn't just, this is my idol. I mean, I tried very hard to emulate her everyday life. Sure. Yes. And I also remember once Griffin and I were going somewhere and I was wearing a ridiculous outfit. And he said, you know, it's funny. My friends were asking me how you dress. And I said, you dress like you're an assistant at Vogue. And I was like, huh, that's so funny. But inside I was like, Yes. That's what Goal I'm going for. Achieved. Right. Um, I I was just uh, trying yes. to remember. You never wore Miranda Priestly for Halloween, were you? Yes, I was. Oh, she was. Okay. I right. can. I, I'll, I'll put Romley it. has. We'll post the picture on our social media. Mm. Romley from from like three to ten had the best run of Halloween costumes that anyone has ever had, which included Miranda Priestly. Yep. Addie Prey from Paper Moon. Sure. Clementine from Eternal Sunshine. Which, Great. in theory, was one of the best, but didn't really work out. Because people didn't get it. People it's hard to track that way. I right. wore It's just an hair and an orange jacket. Orange third jacket, grade, yes. people didn't right. get what she... Sure, she carried sure. on potatoes. But also, my, ha- my hair is brown, <laughs> yeah. and so the blue didn't really show up. Right. But that's, in the movie, it's like the whole point is the dye's kind of coming true, out. Yeah, true, Yeah, that's true, that's true. You had the dyed hair and the hoodie, and you carried the potatoes. It was really good. Um, what were the other ones? Audrey from Little Shop of Horrors. That one was creepy. Sure. That was good. Audrey's scary. You did, the one you did that wasn't directly a movie costume, was inspired by a movie, was the girl who just got dumped. And do you know the story of that? I wanted to be Elle Woods. Thank you. I From said it was Blonde. not directly right. inspired. Right. D- d- yes. And for some reason, it just didn't come together. And I don't know how this came about, but I had all these random little trinkets of Elle Woods. I had like that the heart also necklace. That your favorite scene in the movie was oh, after she gets dumped when she's walking home. I forgot. You thought that look was really funny. Right. So then I was that. I think that's honestly the best Halloween costume I've done. I think so too. I also had an obsession with having fake cigarettes every Halloween. So right. Well, you were Holly Golightly as well. Right. Sure. And you were Coco Chanel once. Right. And that was kind of the last good year. I think I was like 11. Yeah. Right, and then you start doing like group costumes no, with your friends. No, I, and I was Cindy Lauper, which is always forgotten. Oh, yeah. yes, that was forgotten. Yeah, um, but but uh, I mean, a really a really strong portfolio there. Yeah, and then did you just stop or? Well, then I mean, it was like older. cool to be things that weren't real things. I was perhaps my worst Halloween costume in history was uh, freshman year of high school. My friend and I were yin and yang. Mm. Yeah, fuck that. Yeah, um, <laughs> and so we just wore black and white. And sure, sure, I, it's sure. Not, I'm not proud of. I'm it. sorry. <laughs> there is a worse costume you had because it's the one that proves that you're a giant hypocrite. Oh yes, this is yes. Uh, uh, 2012, 2013, whatever it was. Rom texts me and says, "I just saw Spring Breakers. Oh my god, it's literally the worst movie of all time. Great movie, right? A masterpiece, an mm. American masterpiece. Mm. Don't see it. Don't see it. It's so dumb. I right, went to see right, it the next right, day. Right. I said it's a masterpiece." And explain. I mean, essentially, wrote an essay to you, explaining to you why I mansplained. Yeah, great. <laughs> you sound great. Everyone her. sounds great in this, story. right? Right. We were. It was. It was too awful. quite literally ten paragraphs. It was a low point, right? But then that year for Halloween, she was fucking a spring breaker. I have. I, I, I have nothing. I have nothing to say. I mean, I have no. Did you wear no a objection. pink um, 
Yes. Like, sadly, uh, yes. Is there mesh? Yes. I that's feel like they great. have a lot that's of a mesh. Great look. Well, but the thing is, the Your problem. The real problem with this is that it wasn't because we liked the movie or because we thought it would be funny. It was just like, what's a fun costume that girls can do? It it had nothing to do with Harmony Corinne's random choices or... Excuse me. Ha- every choice in that movie is very deliberate. How weird James Fry... You know, it was just a masterful, shitty... Masterful performance from James Shitty He's costume amazing. and an excuse to wear a bathing suit. And I, I'm not proud, but... Desecrating it, a masterpiece. A modern American we've all masterpiece. Done, we've all done things we regret. But yes, I did What's have a What's your worst Halloween mask? costume? Well, sure. Uh, I, I had a lot of bad ones. Yeah, you did. Uh, I also went through a period where I dressed up as uh, visually uh, uninteresting characters from popular movies. Great. So I was John Connor from Terminator 2. You could get him if you had the public enemy shirt. I did. Yeah, well, that's that's. And I had the jacket and the jeans, but everyone thought I didn't dress up for Halloween then. Yeah, right, because, yeah, that's that's not too hard. Right. looks kind of like you. I was Bender from The Breakfast Club. Mm -hmm. Um, I was Kanye West one year, which Mm. I was very proud of. Oh, boy. (laughs) <laughs> Griffin's got a wry smile on his face. Yeah, that's... it was it was uh, the Gold Digger era when he had a very distinctive sure. style, and so I wore like a yellow blazer and pink slacks and like loafers. Sure, and I had buzzed hair at the time, and I had the Kanye glasses, and I didn't do anything no, offensive. I mean, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah, was yeah. Foxy Cleopatra. When oh, Ron was Foxy From Cleopatra, and that was borderline <laughs> We've all that made was, mistakes. That was borderline offensive. We all, but the, yeah, I mean, you bear no responsibility. I know because I, I was in preschool. Right. Yeah, you were four. I, I was four and right. I wore a, a bikini top, gold shimmery pants. Bronzer. And a lot of bronzer and an mm. afro to my preschool <laughs> Halloween party. I went to the preschool Halloween party with, with the family and I stood next to my mother as a parent came up to her and said, is, um... <laughs> Is Romley dressed as a 70s hooker? <laughs> that was the honest guess at what. It, it was my favorite costume. I've never felt happier on a Halloween. And you recited the lines, too. You had a you had like a squirt gun. You went around going, I'm Foxy Cleopatra. I'm a whole lot of woman. That's what she says. Yeah. She's the best of the Austin Powers female leads, in my opinion. No question. She's yeah. great in that movie. I mean, it is, it's actually a bit of a low bar because, yeah, both. I mean, you're up against Liz Hurley and... Uh, Heather Looks Graham. really solid in that. She's Heather okay. Graham's bad. Heather Graham's pretty terrible. Yeah, she is. Uh, but she's a pretty terrible actress. No offense yeah. to Heather Graham, but okay, you know. All right. um, so, Devil Wears Prada. Yes. So I take you to see it. It's like Star Wars, and then you watch it a thousand times. Well, wait, hold on. Let's hear some bad costumes from you, David. Oh yeah. Mm. I'm not. I'm, I'm not a Halloween guy. I like. I couldn't as a even child, tell you. David. Yeah, as a child, like I was a Power Ranger one year. I was like Spider Man. Taran. <laughs> I made a shell, a paper mache shell, and I was Donatello. Sure. The best of the turtles. Yeah. Oh, by far. Yeah. He's he's smart. Did you have a bow staff? I had a bow, and then I got it taken away because I kept hitting kids with it. Sure. (laughs) Sounds like like Ben. (laughs) Yep. So they they took that away from me. Then later in life, because eventually you kind of stop dressing up. That's that's the thing. I, I stopped pretty much as soon as I could. Yeah. Yeah. But then- uh, I was would be invited to parties and like would try to do something. So uh, I had one where I just carry crutches around. And I was selling them, but I told people not to ask me where I got them from. That's so weird. Yeah, it was basically I stole. I had like a whole story behind the costume. I like the more <laughs> questions that someone had to ask, the better the costume was in my mind. Your costume was guy who stole crutches <laughs> from someone. Yeah, and is selling them on the street. <laughs> Solid goal. This is solid goal. Wait, 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 a, a, second. Solid goal. <laughs> wait a second. So your costume was you just wore what you would wear on any given day. Mm-hmm. A very fashionable ensemble. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. But then carried around crutches with you. And then when people asked you what I was wearing, you assumed the role of the character. Yeah. Which was a guy who has stolen these crutches but doesn't want to talk about it. Right. Okay. Uh, anything else? Uh, yeah. One time I shaved my beard into a mustache. And uh, I was giving out free candy, but you had to be uh, young. Is this a joke? Oh, Jesus These are- <laughs> God, he's so ridiculous. That's, that's problematic. Yes, 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 that is hashtag problematic. Why? What's up? <laughs> I don't, I'm not, I don't care. I don't follow you. Oh, Were you at a party with a lot of children? No. <laughs> so you just walked around and you're like... You're not a kid. You're not young enough for this no, candy. No, sorry, yeah. I can't give you candy. 
Well, that was exactly what I expected Me from too. Ben Hosley. Uh, I want to note that the novel, mm-hmm. The Devil Wears Prada. You've never read the novel, right? By Lauren Weiss. No, I have not. Who was was a personal assistant to Anna Wintour for mm-hmm. less than a year and quit mm-hmm. and said that she had a tough time with it. And cashed out and hard. cashed out. Let's, mm-hmm. let's be honest. Yeah. And uh, everyone at Vogue has always been like, she seemed nice. I don't know what she was so upset about. You know, like yeah. they've always been very chill about, mm, I don't know. Um, but uh, she she wrote this book. Book was Devil very Wears big. Prada, big hit. When they announced the movie, it was like, this is going to be, no one knew if it was going to be like a big blockbuster, but it was like, that's a big book. Sure. There was anticipation was for the movie. Right. Yes. And uh, then three years, j- just three years later comes, yeah. comes the movie. It was fast track. And... Uh, Hathaway being in it seemed like, okay, right, that seems to be the kind of career that she's making. It seemed like an obvious choice. Street being in it was like a big kind of like, wait a second. Well, let me give you both of their uh, sort of. Sure. You know, like, yeah, because Hathaway. Princess Diaries is obviously the thing. She had acted a little bit as a teenager, and then Princess well, Diaries, right. she's above the title, and it's a big, big hit. Right, and then she makes Ellen Enchanted and Princess Diaries 2 in 2004. And these movies were why I was already excited. You were, right. you were hyped. Those were big movies for me. But after the 2004 double hit of Ellen Enchanted and Princess Diaries 2, mm-hmm. in which they go mattress surfing, if you may. Oh, I, oh, 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 I know. They go Raven mattress Simone. surfing. Yeah. Uh, she's like, I don't want to make kid movies anymore. Right. I'm done with Disney. She makes Havoc, which is a terrible Stephen Gagan movie. Uh-huh. Gagan. And then and then she makes Broke Back. And then she makes Broke Back in 2005. Which so I've she's never coming seen. off of Broke Great Back. Great movie. But also, uh, which she has a small role in, but is. She's the know. only one who doesn't get nominated for Broke Back. Yes, that's correct. Of the four, of leads. The four leads. So she was kind of like. She had no shot at getting nominated, to be clear. No, although I think she's very good in it. She's totally good. It's but, just but it's yes, the smallest no role. Yes. Yeah. Uh, she's Jake Gyllenhaal's wife in that movie. Um, and then but there's this. She, she locked the gates recently. Uh, oh, uh, with uh, our buddy Mark? I guess not Mark? too recently. Yeah, our buddy Mark. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. She shit her pants and locked <laughs> the gates on WTF, the podcast. And um, it was, I guess it was a couple months ago it was for, for when Colossal it's, came out. Uh, whatever. But she talked about, like, I, there was such a big, uh, hey, we're introducing you the next star. Like when uh, Princess Diaries came out. Sure. They put her above the title and the trailer did the, like, and introducing Anne Hathaway. Anne Hathaway. She'd remember, been in a, what's that TV show, Get Real. With Jesse Eisenberg. Yeah. But I remember Disney putting their full muscle behind her. And the way they did a couple times, they did with Lohan too, where they sure. were like, hey, here's our next movie star. We're letting you know that she's a leading lady. That's the crown being put on her. Right. And then the movie was such a like big crossover success that it felt like she's here. And then she talked about on the podcast how she felt stuck for like five years yeah. only doing kids movies and not working as much as she thought she would yeah. and struggling to get this. And this was like the first big adult role that she really fought for in a studio movie. Mm-hmm. She had done like studio no, indie no, dramas. You're right, you're right. And she said that she was the first choice for it. Sure. Then She's they, well cast. I then they say. got Streep. Sure. And when they got Streep, they were like, oh, maybe this is a tonier movie. And then they took it away from Hathaway. Oh, I didn't know that. And they went to a bigger a, a a bigger bunch of actresses, a bunch of bigger actresses, a bigger bunch of bigger actresses cannot speak today. Mm. And they all turned it down and she like got it back. And this like made her McAdams was who they wanted. Rachel McAdams coming off of the notebook. See, I don't think she would have been good in this. I don't either. No, I think, I think Anne Hathaway is well cast in this. I think this is the movie that cements her like movie star persona. And the thing is, I watched this movie, became obsessed with, further obsessed with Hathaway mm-hmm. because uh-huh. uh, Princess Diaries is big for me. Mm-hmm. But, and then, you know, Les Mis happened and I had a bad taste in my mouth from Hathaway. Sure. But rewatching this movie, you it makes me want to place. rediscover my love for Hathaway. We've been raving about Hathaway because on the Nolan podcast, she we love her. In, Nolan movies. We've talked to her about her a lot recently. In Dark Knight Rises, so we I, love her I've in I've been in a real Hathaway headspace. She's a really fucking good actress. She's, there's some. I would argue her facial expressions in this movie really kill it. Sure. There are some moments yeah. where she just reacts with her face, and it's just spot on. It's a really precise performance. And the thing that people will use to criticize Hathaway if they want to is sure. she's too controlled. She's sure. too studied. Theater kid. There's that theater kid thing about her. But this doesn't feel theater kid it's to me at so all. It's so spot on. Like every moment she makes, even if you can see the gears behind it, mm. it's so artful. And she's not going for the most obvious choice at every moment. I agree. She's also not doing the sort of like 
klutzy thing. She's no. not doing a lot of the obvious pitfalls She's got of a lot the of integrity uh, in this movie. You know, sort of swan princess character she's supposed to be playing. Like you right. know, like that you could do more obviously. Right. There is just kind of a stunning, like like a ballerina level of just like look at her fucking technique in this movie, you know? Just like how in control she is at all times. And then the other thing is that I just like kept on thinking about watching this movie, because the Nolan movies are different, obviously, because sure. it's a whole different look. And they try to scrub her down. She's in more of like a realistic setting, even though it's a Batman movie and sure. a sci-fi movie. Uh, but watching her in this, she has such an interesting face. Like I, I thought about that the whole time. I just remembered this review of uh, Liza Minnelli in Cabaret or something mm-hmm. where they said that like her face looks like it's going in eight different directions. Sure. And the same thing applies to Hathaway where like every element of her face is at such an odd angle and angles that don't feel like they're complementing each other. <laughs> Mm-hmm. This mm-hmm. sounds like a criticism. It does, but no, go on, go on. But it, but it gives her this quality like old movie stars where it's like she has this very distinctive face that doesn't look like anyone else. And mm-hmm. I find her very attractive, but it is this very weird like her eyes kind of slope downwards and she has these very arch eyebrows. Well, the scene and her where – points outwards and she has this pouty mouth. The scene where she goes to the party at the Natural History Museum and she's wearing that outfit and her hair yeah. is up. She looks very old movie star. Very old movie star. And, but she's got this very expressive face and she doesn't look like anyone else who's ever existed. It's true. That's a lot of Hathaway talk. A lot of Hathaway talk. I want to give you a brief Streep summary. Sure. Uh, right? Can we can we just yeah. do a little? Because I, I have a take on Streep, Because that was right? the big thing. Streep being in this movie felt like a game changer. Because when you look at 90s Streep, as I'm doing now, it's a lot of her making these like prestige movies that are kind of bad. And she gets, she gets Oscar for nominations all of them, for, but, but none like, of them have really stood it's the test like, of time. I mean, I love The River Wild. That doesn't count. Sure. But like Bridges in Madison County, Marvin's Room, Dancing at Lufnaza, One True Thing, Music mm-hmm. of the Heart. It's all these kind of like weepy. Yeah. Bridges so, is very good. The Bridges rest of them, is good. Yeah. And Clint, you know, Clint's right. a good director. The rest um, of them are kind of midland. Yeah, but she gets, she's like, you know, gets the autopilot yeah. nominations. Uh, and then in 2002, she's an adaptation. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of like a little where people are like, oh, I haven't seen her be funny like this in a few in a long time. And like, and it was one of her more uh, unaffected performances. She's so good in that. Which I don't say, no, sure. you know, she's better at doing affected than almost anyone alive, if not everyone right, else right, alive. But it's, right, right. More natural performance. She's not doing natural. an accent. She's right. not doing some like true story you thing. See that. Well, she's actually she is, that. but right. Uh, right. Susan Orlean. Um, yeah, and then she's in The Hours. And then she's, yeah, she's doing these weird, like, she's in the Manchurian Candidate, which she's all wrong in, but uh, she's, like, trying these weird things. She's in a series of unfortunate events. Which she's very good. She's funny in that. Yeah. Uh, She's in Prime. She's in a Prairie Home Companion. I feel like she's, like, trying shit out. Right. And And then this is, like, the beginning of her new, uh, like, 50-something Meryl Streep superstar run. When she becomes an A-list movie star, like a bankable leading woman, which she had never really been before weirdly she'd always been the more of the prestige actress right but yeah. she'd never had like huge hits no. that she was top lining and the movies she was in that did well were like anomalies like river's wild you River know wild river Great wild movie. sorry um okay. but comedy ha- had also thank you uh had remained like her white whale because yeah. there was anytime she tried comedy people were like well i guess we found the one thing meryl's not good at sure which i think you look back at those comedies and she's really good in all of them but like becomes her. She Devil was a big flop. Devil mm-hmm. becomes her. Or Death becomes her. My, oh God, Death my brain. Becomes her did okay. Death becomes her did okay, okay. But people slammed her performance at the time. Right. Like that's the weird thing. It was successful, but people went like, "Yeah, but Meryl's trying too hard." No, Goldies, but that was like, always people wanted the, to find the like gap in the armor. Yeah. Which I think she's so good in Death Becomes Her. Sure. Um, and then uh, Postcards from the Edge she got nominated for, but she's wasn't a huge that. hit. Very good in that. But so comedy had been this thing that people were like, it's a little outside of her sure, wheelhouse. Sure, sure. But she's good casting, obviously, playing Anna Wintour. Right. You know? And she doesn't play it as a comedic archetype. She plays it as a real person, oh, which I think surprised everyone. Oh, boy. And I think that she's was real like, good in this movie. That's the magic of this movie. It was the same kind of like Heath Ledger Joker thing where it was like, here's this really weird performance going on in a movie where you don't expect this type of performance to come in. Yeah. And I know it sounds weird to conflate those two performances, but I think it was the same kind of thing where it's like, what's that doing in this? Yeah. It, yes. Meryl Streep, <laughs> man. She should have won the Oscar. Who did she Who did she lose to? Mirren? Mirren. Yeah, that, she was going to lose to Mirren. That's the thing. It's, she would have won the Oscar otherwise. It really yeah. is an incredible performance. It's an incredible performance. And it's annoying that she wins for the Iron Lady a few years later right. where they're obviously trying to recognize, like, we love this new phase of Meryl. Because like, this, this starts the, the run where, like, it had been like, Meryl's won twice. She's never going to win again. Yeah. And then it starts being like, oh, these noms aren't perfunctory. She's maybe. She's doing a whole, like, run of stuff. Right. Know? And it felt like 
four years maybe where she's runner up to whoever actually wins that year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, doubt she's a ham sandwich, but I think a oh, fine ham sandwich. God, I hate her in that. Movie. I know. You I really do. think it's one I know of the worst do. performances. I know as you, is you do. The Iron Lady. She's okay in the Iron Lady. It's just a terrible movie. I uh, I think she won in Iron Lady for the dementia. Stuff. How do you feel about Mamma Mia, Romilly? I love Mamma Mia. Yeah. Meryl I mean, Streep's number one box office hit. Yeah, I love Meryl and Mamma Mia too. Sure, she's a blast. But that's another because she's a you... she's a carefree Meryl and Mamma Mia. It is Mia. true. She, whereas in this, she right. is not carefree. Right. And the uh, oh god, there's so many good moments. I mean, it's an awful movie, but. Uh, the, it's like the worst movie I ever liked. That's how I think the about worst movie I've ever She's liked. like um, running an island where like no, people come I know, to but vacation. It's like, another, like I just want to be all different Merrills. I mean, sure. obviously yeah. I want to be Julia Child Merrill. Yep, great Merrill. Oh, right. Which right. is the other one that she should have Which is yes. two, two cheese, and two cheese honestly, running wild in that one that too. That movie should be my favorite Merrill movie. Of course it's about I've cooking. I've seen that movie once. Well, the Amy Adams stuff is bad. Yeah, yeah. it's really There's right. actually character... a cut on Vimeo that removes all of the oh, Amy I... Adams stuff. But, but let's say this. Amy Adams in that movie is what inspired you to become a food blogger. That is true, too. Mm-hmm. Which is now, like, mostly, I mean, that's, you're you're about to start working at a food magazine. Right. And, somewhere and... in between Amy Adams and Julie Julia and well, Anne Hathaway in Devil Wears Prada. Right. right. Um, that movie also, how old was I when I, because... Julie, I started, Julie, it's 08, maybe? Uh, that's, remember. like, right when I started Food Blog. No, that was later. That was 09. I think you were 11. I started Food Blog at 11. Yeah. Right. It was after Romilly that movie. is much more accomplished than either of the us, just to make clear. Yeah, Romilly's yes. 09, you're right. 09. Um, but, but honestly, I, I will say these movies, these Meryl Streep vehicles, have been very influential in my career. My early career, right. whether it's the Meryl character or not, the the genre of film she's right. in. We've got three. It's complicated. Devil Wears Prada, Julie and Julia. Mamma Mia, Mamma Mia. I want. I would love Mom's to own, own an island. <laughs> own I mean, I'd like to own an island too. <laughs> no, 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 no. I would love to like SOS have a, to a bed and breakfast where I cook sure. seasonal food right, and right, make right, people's. But I, but I think you that's make, like, always been pancakes for people. Yes. Like the way a lot of little girls have like. The, the complex, the fantasy about like the prince like rolling up and like whisking you away. Sure, sure. You've always aligned more with like the Meryl, it's complicated, Mamma Mia thing where it's like three guys were competing for you and at the end you're kind of like, I'm, I'm kind of good on my own. That's island. the thing. It's, it's never, <laughs> the movies that have inspired me have never been about, oh, like these people will come into your life. It's always about like, you can be this. Yeah. You can be this one this great the, woman and you don't need anyone else. But, but you want the attention. Like you want the guys who, but just who for are fun. striving for, right, right. That's right. the thing. The Meryl but comedies. But at the end, I want to be like, hey, I have everything I need. Right. There are these guys who are like less after and you're like, okay, let me humor you for a little bit. And make bit. some right. lavender pancakes and I'm good. Oh, I'd love a lavender pancake. <laughs> no, they're actually so awful. Because I just remember, like everyone's criticism of uh, it's complicated at the time was like, geez, this is the least relatable character character conflict i've ever seen she can't figure out how to redesign course, yes. her kitchen it also came out right during the recession and it, it was Bad ill-timed timing. yes yes yes, yes. <laughs> but like rom watched that and it was like <laughs> like it was like spotlight for her like it was like <laughs> this needs to get done like this is important right and like also a lot of people would probably watch that and want to be lake bell sure sure, sure. no no you don't no, want to be that lake character bell. no yeah. yeah i'd be lake bell just in life i mean yeah. she seems like she has She's a, nice got a good, life. good career guy Okay, so let's let's start talking about this movie. No, it's fine. Uh, we're doing good. Yeah. I don't have a train to catch today. Right. I just feel great. Like after the stress of we had to record a, mo- a podcast about my favorite movie before I had to catch a train. Yeah, everything else is just gravy. <laughs> this is easy. How you doing? Easy Griffin? straight. I'm I'm really tired. Mm-hmm, he's tired. We're gonna do three podcasts this week. Yeah. Um, um uh, what was the thing I was gonna say? This movie had, I think, we talked in our Stellar episode about trailers. I love. Right, trailers that I'm very emotionally attached okay. to. I don't remember the trailer for this, this movie. movie had at all. one of the smartest trailers I've ever seen, and uh-huh. it started a trend that I think somewhat revolutionized the industry. It is used selectively, but every time it's been used well, it makes the movie blow up and become a bigger hit. Yeah, the trailer for this movie was not a montage of scenes. Sure, the trailer for this one movie scene. I have seen this trailer was Hathaway showing up, waiting for the interview, and yes. the buildup of Priestley coming out of the elevator. Yeah, the gird your loins. Oh, that was very uh, good. Yeah, you know, yes, I do remember this trailer, and I remember being released and being like, "Huh, this seems like cleverer than I thought this movie was going to be." I will say this movie does an incredible job at sequences. Mm-hmm. It's a very montage movie, which you but love montages. It hits us I with love- two clanging montages within 35 minutes. I checked the time code and yelled about it to okay. Diana. Also, the music. Oh, the music. There's some real, Tunstall. real time and place like, needle suddenly drops. Suddenly I see. Yeah. Yeah. Which oh. was your favorite song after this movie? Of course. It's stuck in my head right now. Yeah. It's but, the, yeah. but 
I mean, obviously, just because it it satisfied my fashion cravings. The when she comes out in all the amazing outfits, the sure. And I remember yeah. turning Pass, by turning her. to my mom and be like, "That's such a good outfit." And then the next one come out like, "Oh my god!" Like it was just really exciting for me. Um, whether or not it's great filmmaking, um, but the the beginning sequence. The beginning with, sequence with where all the, the fashionable are women dressed, are getting dressed, and, dressed, and she gets the onion bagel. Hey, right. A great beginning hey, starts like any day. Wake up and your morning routine. That's a great place to start a movie. <laughs> He's not wrong. Right? I, I hit the alarm clock. I want to yeah. say this movie has three Take items shower, of food. <laughs> throw on some clothes. Maybe have a cup of coffee. That's how you start a movie, baby. You're right. You're right. Because this we is all how this know person's day that's starts. how the day starts, and that's how the movie starts. Yeah, he's right. He's okay. totally right. Uh, but yeah, this movie has three items of food that I love uh, that are uh, important to the plot. The onion bagel, mm-hmm. um, the uh, Smith and the Wolensky steak that is thrown in the sink, which, which is like the so greatest good. tragedy. And, 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 and the sprinkling of parsley. I mean, oh, I, I would just, oh, I would just call it a food it. movie right there. It's a, oh, it's a mo- and movie then it's about food. And it's thrown in the goddamn sink. And the, uh, the uh, grilled cheese out. sandwich. No. The, with that's the Jarlsberg. The, the grilled cheese sandwich with $8 of Jarlsberg in it. Fucking... Adrian Grenier is constantly surprised that Dean and DeLuke is expensive in this movie. He keeps saying, like, God, the eight dollars of these strawberries are so expensive. But no rushing. chef would ever shop it. Like no chef no. like that would shop Wait, is at Dean and DeLuke. Is he a chef or is he a pizza man? It's not He's clear. a chef. <laughs> I, I do think it's a questionable choice that they have him working at Bubby's because he is working at Bubby's. Right, he's he used at to go Bubby's, but he's like so self serious, and he's a chef. It's like Bubby's is kind of a off. fun place, like it's Bubby's good food, like but the whole chicken. idea. But it's yeah. a lot of it's like drunk food, yeah. right? Which it's I guess is in line with expensive, like, in line yeah. with his grilled cheese making at night. I mean, everything he makes her is always at night when she's stressed out. Sure, but and she usually refuses it. But like he's a fool. way too serious about his career to, uh, like, he acts as if he's a. Top, right, top, yeah, right. He does. This, yes, this yes, movie would have worked better if he was low level chef, like a, at line a much chef. better restaurant. Exactly. Right, right, if he right, was right. a line cook at like a a, a big sort of. Michelin I just thought it was restaurant. an interesting right. choice. Yeah, I mean, he's a scrub in this movie. He sucks. Uh, he is one of the worst written boyfriend characters. It's it's he so really, crazy. Really sucks. Ooh, I don't uh, think it's Grenier's fault, but he's not helping. Okay, so he, so here's what I, when I was younger and I watched this, I actually liked his character. Sure. Probably because he was I did cooking too. a lot right. of that. Yeah, he's right. cooking. Yeah. Rewatching right. it now, I couldn't decide if I found him insufferable or if the character's bad. I think the character's really bad, but he, he's a he's not pretty insufferable matters. actor. Yeah. No offense, I mean, Adrian. We even live his near face each other. I see you on the street all the time. Mad. Yeah. yeah, he's got that. He's got those lips. I mean, uh, talk about this is such a movie of facial expressions. His facial expressions <laughs> are just he, infuriating. He purses his lips a lot. A lot. Yeah, I know, but it doesn't movie, work. No, 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 it, it does work not work. Yeah. I remember when I was first saw this movie, I was like, Jesus, she's got the chef boyfriend who's like totally cute and makes her the grilled cheese sandwich. Why won't she classic, just chill out like, with him? Of course, yeah. she's a chef boyfriend. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then now I watch it. I'm like, this guy is an asshole yeah, about sucks. her having a job. Yeah. Like, it's kind of you. like the more you think about it. He's mad when she starts to do well. He's mad when she's doing well. It's yeah. your job. He does he a lot of that. He doesn't care when Very she's passive, being aggressive. emotionally abused in the beginning and is wearing ugly shoes. True. But as soon as she looks good yeah, it's frightens and is him. getting recognition, he's, threatened. he's like, fuck the job. You're so much better than this. And it's like, no, she's actually doing well. Yeah. And and it also, I mean, like maybe this is Hathaway's failing that she's too good that it actually hurts the movie. Maybe. But when she gets sucked into the world, you don't feel like her soul is being corrupted. No, exactly. Because she, she has so chill. much integrity. It's so, like, okay, she's caught up in all this stuff, but she's like still a real person. And, yeah. and watching it, I realized that part of why this movie works so well is because never you never want her to quit the job. No. Ever. Yeah, that's the thing. Quitting the job no. seems like a bad move. Right. They're like, just do the job. The whole job. time, when, as soon as she starts killing the job, you're like, yes, this is great. Because she doesn't turn into a bad person. Right. Regardless of the fact that she misses Adrian Grenet's birthday. Like, well, you know, she's still a good person. And it's, she doesn't become vapid ever. No, right. I agree. And I think a shittier version of this movie, and I'm not giving credit right. to Frankel. I'm giving credit to those two actors. I think a shittier version of this movie, the person playing Andy would have started playing it more vapid where she right. becomes insufferable. And I think yep. Priestley would have just been a villain and she you would have gone get the fuck away. But Instead, I, she ahead. just works really well. Yeah. And, it, you know, regardless of, I mean, I think the her being well-dressed is it just an add-on. But re- it's not like she bec- is well-dressed and then everyone likes her and she's doing better. Like, she right. actually she, is in charge of the job. She sells that transformation right. as an actress. Right. Yeah. But I would say Weisberger's failing. Mm-hmm. 
in writing this book. And who Aline Brosh, Aline Brosh McKenna wrote the movie, who also wrote We Bought a Zoo. We should yes. uh, shout her out. Right. Uh, uh, one of the and only podcast like made, episodes Romley's listened to. Yes. Because she's seen that movie. Uh, this like made her career. It did. She yeah. wrote 27 Dresses. She wrote Morning Glory. She became like the sort of a... Uh, that's, that's such a... Uh, and, and she's rom-com. one of the main forces behind uh, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Yes. She like got that on the air. But this was, this is like such a big calling card movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Sorry. Uh, but I do feel like it's like when she quits, it's supposed to be triumphant at the end. And you're kind of like, so mad. Eh, stick it out for three more months. You know, whatever. She it gets almost, the job anyway, I guess. But it almost feels like that's the breakup at scene. The mirror, though. Yeah. It's so yeah, true. At, at the, yeah. the, the mirror. What, what do you think the mirror is supposed to be? I thought it was Observer. Yeah, exactly. It's not even like the Daily News. I think she's getting a job at the Observer or the New York Sun. Uh, yeah. RIP, New York Sun. Yeah. Uh, like it's it's not that great a job. She's doing okay. No, she's doing okay. Who's that actor who plays the editor there? He's in like everything. That guy. But you know what I was thinking too is that in the beginning, was why she defends Runway is because really good writers. Yeah, write she's for saying it. like, hey, they have like right. a Joan Didion piece. So why or, doesn't she just start writing good things yeah, for Runway? Move over yeah. to editorial. Right. right. Hey, it's well, like is it maybe because like my thought was we're all like savvy New York people. And, but there is this, I mean, there is this accessibility of it being a little bit more mainstream. And my whole feeling of like what we're discussing is it's like the common man is going to like sort of appreciate these like choices in the story or something. Does that make sense? I, I just love you saying the common man. We're just looking at it from a career choice. Yeah, it's we're, like, all, okay, all of us in this runway, room, you get sure. more. Fuck, I'm, I'm sorry, sure. I missed there, your birthday. Who there, gives a shit? I'm exactly, hustling, yeah. motherfucker. There's something yeah. kind of fantastical if, if you are far away from New York about the very world that this movie is taking place. Right. In. Yeah. And this and movie is, is what were we going to say? It's such a New York movie, too. It's such a New York movie. And the point I was going to make is it's it's. It's working off of some of that same Sex in the City mojo sure. of like, look at this, except it's kind of popping the hood on the car and showing you how the stuff actually works. It's not right. just like, where's their money coming from? Where are they getting all these clothes from? Right. Like this movie's about how that world is structured and functions. A little bit. Which I think makes it more interesting. One thing it does well, too, is she doesn't start buying those clothes. She's given all those. She's clothes. If, those clothes. if she showed up at work wearing that, you know, all those ensembles, you would be really mad. She's making yeah. 32 like, grand right, a year. Right, yeah. Yeah. Right. It's like if, if that in, in 2006. OK, so beginning in the movie, she is a high school, uh, a journalism she's graduate. She's a high school graduate. She's yeah. a high school graduate. Then <laughs> she, she went to college. She's a journalist coming from Northwestern, which yes. has a renowned journalism school. Yeah. Our, our uh, father's alma mater. True. Yeah. Uh, she's, After a few, a few yeah, there different were a couple different stops, colleges yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, sure. She's at uh, Condé Nast. I mean, they, it's called something else or whatever. But yeah. And she's been. I think she. The idea is she's being sent around to a couple of the magazines. She's got her connections. She's got her referrals, but nothing's right. really sticking. She's going in for a bunch of interviews, and she is so like sort of whooshed into Miranda Priestley's office to interview as her second assistant. Right. Uh, next to her first assistant, Emily, who played by Emily Blunt. Jesus. Fucking is, Christ! Not good this in performer. this movie. I mean, so good in this movie that she almost got an Oscar nomination, which is pretty crazy when you think of no one who knew who she was, and she's playing like a total should be stereotype character. Our, our mother when she it's her to see second it. performance I on screen. I mean, in a movie, so, so I think she'd been in some TV. Uh, I, mostly stage, but um, our mother and I, uh, we went to see My Summer of Love together when that came out, uh, sure. which was her great first movie. movie. Uh, big fan of the movie. It's a uh, Excellent. Pavel pa- pa- Pavlovsky, or how yeah, you say his name? I've interviewed Ida. him. He's very nice. Yes, um, great director. Mm-hmm. Uh, we went to see that movie, and we're just like, Jesus fucking Christ! Who is this Emily Blunt? She's oh, really I have good. to watch she, that movie. She's, you have to see she's that. scary in that movie. She's sort of the villain. Very terrifying. I very cold. It. Very internal. It's on Griffin's coming of age movie list for it's me. A good I, coming of age movie. It's a great that one. That is right? true. Um, but she's phenomenal in that, and we mm-hmm. are both like, geez, she's going to be a big star. But then, like, this is her second movie. She gets, like, a plum supporting role in a big studio movie that happens sure. to blow up. And she's just immaculate. She's really good. Like, she's that. boxing at the same level as Meryl Streep she in this is. movie. She is. She's terrific. And in she's, it. like, 24 in this? Uh, like, how old is Emily Blunt? I in can... this movie, I think she's 24 years old. That's fine. Yeah. She was 21, I think. Yeah, in... you nailed it. She's, like, 23, 24. She Insane. Was born, she was, she's three years older than me. Yeah. I think in three years, I'm going to be where Emily Blunt is. Right? You yeah, so? you got a lot of catching up to do, but I think you're I think at an accelerated. You're moving at a good there. pace now. But she gets a Globe nomination. She gets a BAFTA nomination. Like, oh, you know what I mean? What I was she say. was like in the in the sort of zone. What I was going to say is my mom and I see uh, Summer of Love and we're like, Emily Blunt's going to be a huge star. When we saw in the trailer for Devil Wears Prada, it's like, oh, cool. Emily Blunt's getting like American work, but it wasn't clear how big her role sure, was. Sure. She takes Rom to see it and says Emily Blunt's going to get nominated for an Oscar. 
And I mocked my mom. I said, that's insane. What yeah, are you too talking soon, too soon. about? Like, yeah, right, right. Even if she's good, that she's too uh, new. But then she got the BAFTA and the Globe. Yeah, she almost it made it. It felt like she was within like reaching distance. Looking back, she totally should have gotten it. It's also insane Emily Blunt has yet to be nominated yet because she has yet to give it's a, lot of disrespect. a bad performance she's ever. Great. She's great. In any genre. She's great. Love she's Emily incredible. Blunt. I think her character is the best character in the movie. I do too. I do too. She's it's, sort of the secret lead of the movie. So yeah. she's the most human character. Agreed. Because, this is Romilly's yes. take. I like this take. We she, try, this. she cares. Like so Hathaway much. doesn't care and does really well. And that's Emily's failing is she cares too much. Blunt cares so much right. and yeah. doesn't get anything more than anyone else. Yeah. And I, it's not like she's closer with Miranda. It's not like she's further on. I mean, every time she's like, you have 15 minutes for lunch and I have 20. I mean, she cares about the minutia mm-hmm. because this job is her entire existence. Right. Yes. She looks up to everyone else so mm-hmm. much and she never really gets that payoff. And in turn, she's just so insecure. And it's an incredible performance, aside from the fact that, like, every single line is a knockout in terms of her line readings. She, like, it's she just does some great lines. consistent, like, fastballs, right? Um, the arc of this character is really interesting because she's presented as being like impenetrable, right? right? Like this woman is immaculate, right? She's just got it all going on. She knows every single move. She's dismissive to everyone. She's constantly high status. Mm -hmm. And as the movie goes on, you start to see the cracks where it's just like like, how vulnerable she is and and how much effort she puts into everything. I mean, everything is just so like she, she goes home and she thinks, how am I going to impress Miranda tomorrow? But it's not just attitudinal. You start to see the strain of how much. She's burning I, the candle at both ends to do this job and I think well. Perhaps the most poignant moment is when she uh, Hathaway has to call her to tell her that she's going to Paris, and she's like kind of shitting on Miranda and is like, "Oh, then I have to do this and this buying and this." The scarves, right. yeah. Buying the scarves, but she's, she fucked up. She admits she, that it's she one forgot. of her right. few moments of weakness. Right. Yes, um, and she she's like very human. Yes. Yeah. And she's finally, because she feels close enough with Andy. That's the thing. She's she finally, finally opening, is yeah. letting her guard down. There's, there's the museum now. scene right. beforehand where she talks about the cheese diet. Right. Where she doesn't, doesn't eat. eat anything until right. she's starving and then she eats a cube of cheese, which I think about all the time. The, and doesn't she do say, that. I'm one I'm one stomach flu I'm away from someone, my ideal which weight. Is so from my goal weight, yeah. uh, my Paris weight, whatever. Yeah. And then, right. And then the scene not long after, right, where she's trying to get the scarves, the Hermes scarves in time. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, gets the, hit by a cab. <laughs> we should. You know, that is the punctuation. You know the crazy thing that happens with this movie, right? Shoot. So she blows up in this movie, and Fox immediately. This like, is a Fox movie, we should say. Yes, this yeah. is a Fox movie. Fox, Fox two thousand. Like, yes. Emily Blunt. We're putting a pin in you. Sure. We're signing a deal for you to be in another Fox movie. Mm-hmm. We want to get you in the ensemble of another Fox movie. Uh-huh. So they had like an IOU deal with Emily Blunt. Emily Blunt gets offered. Black Widow and Iron Man. She does, and I was and we, not offered, announced. She was announced. She as was the announced star. as playing Black Widow, yes. the Scarlett Johansson part, who's now in all the Marvel movies, and she would have been great, probably. And I'm not a Scarlett Johansson fan. Well, I remember when Scarlett was in those movies, she when Scarlett was cast, though, I was like, Ugh. you know. But anyway, first and in Iron Man two, she's shaky. Yeah, she's she, got the, she's got the ring. She ring gets notes. really good later. Yeah, yeah, I think. I think no. Uh, I think Avengers figured out how to write that character. Yeah, we didn't figure it out. Right, and she sort of grew into it and became more believable as she got older and, and all of that. But Blunt was first announced, and then Fox went, uh, 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 we still have you under contract, uh-huh. and pulled her out of Iron Man 2 in order to do, do you remember what the movie is, is they made her do? Is it the Jane Austen book club? It is not. It is Gulliver's that. Travels. Oh, oh, that is oh, so even worse. Painful. Oh, God, with Jack Black. Yes. Jason oh. Siegel. Which people don't even remember she was in. And that also doesn't come out for years because, yeah. like, the visual effects were hard and yes. it, they kept pushing it. I feel like that movie came out, like, three years after it was filmed. Yes. So she got blocked out of being in, like, 12 Marvel movies. Sorry, Emily. To do – I mean, and she's built an incredible career for herself. But it's yeah, one but of those big Yeah, but it took her a ifs. while. It took her a while to, like – because she's in a lot of movies I after this like movie. she only really, like, started becoming, like, a serious leading lady – in in studio films in the last like two years yeah because it was like when she's in looper which is six years later right people are kind of like emily blunt's pretty good in looper like that's an interesting thing to say she's always been perfect i mean in she, everything she really i've never seen a bad blunt I've, performance. I, no i've never seen a blunt performance that's less but than I, great i've yeah. never been salmon fishing in the yemen to be fair i haven't been either i haven't salmon fished in the yemen which yet. let's acknowledge is one of her Five Golden Globe nominations. The Globes keep on locking. And she's her. getting another one next year for Mary Poppins Returns. Just zero question. She is locked. She's locked. 
the yeah. fuck in yeah. <laughs> for that one. That um, kind of feels like it's going to be the big test for her, you know? Yeah. Because that's just such big shoes to fill, but everyone's kind of like... She'll she'll do fine. I think she's going to kill it. Yeah. All right. So Andy gets... In this opening scene, Andy's being... Uh, the trailer. Rushed yeah. in, right, to meet with you Miranda. Meet, you meet the Andy main doesn't even know who Miranda is, practically. Whirlwind, and, and it's Emily's kind of... Like, oh. It's a rom-com version of the, the Aaron Sorkin walk and talk. Sure. And Tucci, corridor, Tucci right. blasts in, and he says, gird your loins. <sighs> Another now, person who should have been Oscar nominated for yes. this movie. Yes. Yes. The best performance in the movie. We're in my not opinion. getting better than Stream. We're not I getting, getting a touch. Number one. No, no, not, not a touch. Oh, no. We're, We're getting, getting two It's a sperm handfuls of Tucci. <laughs> Rom, a thing you need to know is that Ben loves a touch of the Tucci. I love he does. It. Anytime love. he can get a touch of the Tucci, just a touch of the Tucci in the movie, tooch. he is pleased. But this movie... Like Spotlight tooch. is a classic touch of the Tucci. Tucci is tooch. the second best character in this movie. Who's the best? Miranda. Blunt. Oh, well, yeah. Best character. She's good, too. Yeah. Ah, you're right. Blunt's right. my top performance. A lot of great performances. Yeah. A lot of great performances. Yeah. yeah. This movie should have gotten three Oscar nominations. <laughs> Four. I mean, it, it got a well-deserved costume nomination. Yes. Very rare. One of the only movies to get a contemporary costume and you know, nomination. Rewatching it, I think that's well-deserved because the costumes actually hold up. Yes, they do. I think there's one outfit that does There's one up. outfit that is a fucking disaster, yeah. in Which my one? opinion. Where she's got the hat. And this like crazy necklace. Yes. Oh no! You see, that's very Coco Chanel. I, I remember know. Yes. And the hats. shirt with the with the, those hats, the like shoulderless the, the, yeah, no. sweater. You see, oh my god! I've thing. seen yeah. I I've seen women at like fashion women wear that. This I mean, day. David, maybe we should defer to Ben and Ram in this issue because they're like the fashionistas. Just, they're the people going to fashion week to that, know the trend. That is yeah. that is a big Chanel move. That hat because that jumped out to me as like those too necklaces far. Hat still is worn. That's yeah. just me and yeah. me and Joanna were evaluating every outfit as we saw yeah. them. We were always like, we love her jackets. We think, and we wear some great jackets in Agreed. this movie. That's the only one where we where we both in agreement. Like, no, no, it's um, not, she's Ram not pulling this off. Ben live in this world. They I know we don't fashion. live in this world. I, I'm not denying. That. I think I also like. I mean, this is just kind of based off of reality. But Priestley never wears insane outfits, and nor does Wintour. Yes, which is good. Yeah. Yes, right. Wintour right, right. always looks like kind of unexciting. Yeah, no, I've, but that's uh, just her place. She just doesn't really go out of her she's comfort box, right, right? Exactly. Um, and Streep does the same thing. It's uh, a thing. Uh, I have. I should say I've yes. ridden in an elevator with Anna Wintour, and I've held a door open for Anna Wintour. I've interacted with her twice in the Condé Nast building. Wait, Ram and I. Ram. Yeah. Ram was my stylist for the Tech premiere, mm-hmm. and uh, we went to get uh, my outfit tailored. And while we were waiting for them to do the tailoring, they did a very quick job. Okay. Uh, Ram kind of tapped me and went. Look over there mm-hmm. and point it up on the shelf. It was Anna Wintour's dry cleaning. Oh, like four or five boxes the, of them. The and that was dry cleaning, such a, a plot that was point such in this a movie. Devil Wears Prada moment yeah. because mm-hmm. they just had like five white boxes that said A Wintour, and I was just oh. waiting for Andy to swoop in and pick up. And I, I thought like, I wonder if first of all they ever mess up her dry cleaning because shit would really hit the fan. I felt really good about. The fact that that's where we were getting. Me too. Right. Because it then, was like, they're not going to fuck shit up if they take care of Wintour's garb. You sure, know? true, sure. Yeah, it's true. I mean, she would have ultimate trust. Right. That's, but that's I was also just point. wondering if if the it assistant ever takes, takes the wrong box. Sure. Leaves the box. Sure. I'm These sure. These are all just big. You also, she's been editor-in-chief of Vogue for practically 30 years. I'm right. sure there have been mistakes. But you also looked like you wanted to run up there and rip open the box and just scan what, what is had. it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, I once was What's in the box. <laughs> anytime I, I've been to the Connie Nass building many times, usually just to get lunch with Richard and Katie who work uh-huh. at Vanity Fair. And um, uh, once I held the door open absentmindedly for someone like as I was walking yeah. out of into a hallway and it was Anna Winter and she just went, thank you. As, as I as she like swooshed by me. And once I wrote an elevator she said with her, thank you. She was very polite. And I've seen her at premieres wearing the sunglasses like famously yeah. she wears sunglasses even uh, in the movie. Theater. Yes, like because uh, right. I think there's some suggestion that she has uh, damaged eyes. She does not. Uh, I mean, that's, that's made just up? bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So Andy interviews sort of with Miranda, who's this terrifying arch figure, but incredibly quiet. And Very calm quiet and poised. still. Uh, barely says show. anything. Speaks yeah. in a whisper. Mm-hmm. Barely looks up from her shit. Usually, yeah. And uh, that's all. Like, that's all. You know, yeah. So that's all. It's really good. Yeah. Uh, sometimes there's a sort of a, a mild hand gesture. Also, I do think a lot of times in movies when they try to 
emulate a real person sure. uh, or figure their name is off. Miranda yeah. Priestley is such it's a good perfect. name. Good name. It's perfect. Such a good name. She is Anna Wintour to down to she's English. Yes. She right. has that sort of like lilting accent. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's married. Uh, she's on her second husband, and he's this sort of like vaguely important washing. Maybe he's a lobbyist or something. You don't know. Sure. Like, which is what Mar- Anna Winter's always married to some sort of person in the corridors of power, or mm-hmm. was. She's not married anymore. Yeah. And uh, all the details are great. I mean, Runway's yeah. a pretty good name for magazine. Yeah, That's I was another thing that. I think they Runway's usually a fuck good up ma- on. Yeah, they usually fuck that up so. Yeah, bad. like if they called it like Fashion Week magazine like, or Ugly Betty Stiletto. Yeah, Ugly Betty, which comes Stiletto out the same is year. Really bad. Yeah, Ugly Betty has the same kind of premise, sort of. You yes. know, I mean, it's set in a fashion magazine. Comes out the same year and has suddenly I see by Katie Tunstall in the yeah, pilot. Uh, so it was, really, and I remember it has like a terrible name mode. Oh, oh, you know, and it's like that, so you I messed think, it up. I Runway's think this movie perfect. does well with those those elements. I agree. Uh, supposedly, when the movie came out, Anna Wintour's office was too close to how this movie makes her office look, so she totally changed her office. Although I've been told, like, if you walk into Anna Wintour's office, you have to walk a long way before you get to Anna Wintour. Interesting. Like she, it's like a cavern, and she's at the back. Well, I've I've told this story here about when. From Mulaney, we did the rehearsal in Lauren Michaels' office. Sure. And Lauren wasn't there, but they were like, yeah, it's just like a room that's open at 30 Rockets. He has like five offices in that one building. Right, right. And right. the one we went to was dead on Jack Donaghy's office. Right. Like that laid makes sense. out the exact same way. <sighs> and he had like the globe that turned into the bar mm-hmm. and Classic. all of that. And then Mulaney was like, oh my God, like this is the only time I've ever been in here where Lauren wasn't here. I'm going to do what I've always wanted to do. And he hit the wall and the door opened. And it was the bathroom, which sure. is the joke in 30 Rock, right, right. that he has a bathroom hidden in the wall. Like, all of that was taken. Uh, we should get Mulaney on this podcast. And then we should get Lauren on this podcast. Yeah, agreed. I'll email both of them. I talk Thanks. to them both a lot. Yeah, yeah. Please Very do. Is it, what is it? Lauren.michaels at NBC.com? Yes, it always is. <laughs> it always is. Lauren.michaels at example.com. At SNL.edu. <laughs> <laughs> I was just Mulaney was so good on Gethard recently. Have you seen that episode yet? I haven't. I've been I've, phenomenal. You're yeah. really good. I'll, I'll watch it. That's it. All. I'll no, watch I know you. I watch I know you. It's. I actually went to uh, before I got this job that I'm starting. Uh, I had two possible jobs. One uh-huh. was this, and another was working at a fashion magazine. Sure. Um. And oh, are you gonna tell this is a boss story about how you contacted her? Yes. Let's just so say it hear there's it. this woman who worked at Harper's Bazaar for a while. And then got named the editor in chief of InStyle magazine, sure. which previously wasn't that highly regarded. No, I think of that as uh, right. shopping for morons. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. But she kind of turned it around, has flipped the fashion industry because she's really smart and she's really funny and she's really nice. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you're and you're a pretty good social media stalker. Like you're right. pretty good at keeping tabs on the people you respect to figure out how right. they're living their lives. Yes. And I think and there is copy. this weird, yeah. not weird, this great new movement in fashion where being a bitch isn't cool. <laughs> right, right, right. Winter um, is sort of an right. older generation. Like right. people uh, idolize women like this a lot more now than they than Winter or others. Sure. Yep. Um. So and, and there's this woman who you know the, I, I think also fashion blogging helped. A lot with that because now women who like have actual things to say can become big in the fashion world it's and they don't have to. It's not a hermetic universe exactly. that it's hard they to break into. Keepers. Yeah, right, 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 yeah. right, right. Um, So I saw this woman and I was like, okay, I really want to work for her. Um, I don't know if fashion's really the right move for me because of movies like this, but I was like, worth a shot. Um, and I was like, I need to get to her. And so what I did was... I had previously been emailing someone at Food and Wine magazine. Sure. And I realized that Food and Wine and InStyle are both under Time Inc. Of course. So I just looked at how the emails were formed. The domain name. The domain name. And sent an email out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. First name, last name. First name, last name. At InStyle. The only question usually is, is there a dot? Exactly. You did no dot? I think there's a dot. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's a dot. And it paid off. Mm -hmm. So now I'm just going to email, you know. Barack.obama at gmail.com. Yeah. Yep, that's his email um, address. But, yes. But Romley, like... Send cold, him a meme. Romley cold emailed somebody through guessing their email address and was like, hey, I'm just applying for the job. Can I... Can and I got an interview. Hey, man. That, that's that's boss. Yeah. People, this is how you network. Listen yeah. up. Blank check has networking advice. Yeah. We are a practical podcast. But then she got scooped by another job first. And so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, so she gets the job. Surprisingly. 
She like goes back. She home. gets the job right. It looks like she flubs it because she doesn't know anything about runway. She care. And Miranda's like, you are you wrong. Though. About- she does not get back home. She walks directly outside of the office, and Blunt comes and swoops her up and says, rolls her eyes. Okay, I am wrong. Which is an interesting point yes. because it's quite unlikely that she would just walk out of the building and immediately be recruited to her first True. day of work. Sure, there's yes. some right. uh, agree. And so for the first, like, 20 minutes of this movie, she's the new assistant who's bad at her job. She's not into it. Right. And a she lot of this like is just dope. the first day. Like, the whole yeah. first chunk of the movie like, is, like, yeah, right, being yeah. thrown to the deep end. The yeah. cerulean sweater scene, like, yeah. all that Great stuff. Great scene when she goes to the cafeteria with Tucci. With Can we Tucci. talk about her friends? Okay. No so. one in New York City has a group of friends like this. <laughs> now, what are you period. talking about? What, that, do you, what do you mean? It's insane. They all Here. grew up together. <laughs> it's like the it, like that ensemble, the way they portray that group of friends, it's like, get the fuck out they of here. They have great banter. Her two best friends are also best friends with her boyfriend. Yeah, I know, so and like, also they have like weekly dinners. It, yeah. it seems at, like. At, in like Tribeca. Yeah. Right? yeah God knows what they all do. One of them is an artist who seems, Tracy Thomas plays an artist who takes like very big pictures of New York. And sort of leans them against the wall. Like yes. very, we're talking like 12 <laughs> feet like tall pictures. I think she's really good in this, actually. She Everyone's is good. good. Everyone's yeah. really good They get good at it. It's Rich the Summer, Tracy really Toms, good. Yeah. Toms, Toms, yeah. Toms, I forget how you are. But, but it is one of those things and, where they uh, like Grinny. set it up like the four best friends who have been best friends forever and never go two days without seeing each other. And they're trying to break into New York. Are yeah. one couple. Sure. And then two other friends of theirs right. who are not together. Do you know what I'm saying? This really I, I sounds do. like the worst friend group. No, it's rife with Because <laughs> I think it yes. does really revolve around Andy and Grinny. Right. But, uh, and then the rest of them are just like, oh, Andy, what, yeah. oh. Yeah. What's Grinny's? Nate. That's his Nate. name. Oh, yeah. 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 No, it's such, he's such a Nate. It in this. is weird watching this because this is like a couple years into Entourage. David Frankel did some Entourage. This mm-hmm. was clearly the studios being like, well, he's doing a pretty good job pretending to be famous. What if we actually put him in real movies? Sure. And it felt like everyone was like, Nope, this is weird. I can't watch it. It feels like watching a Vinny Chase thing. It's kind of why he was good in Entourage in that weird sort of way where it's like, yeah, he kind of looks like a movie star, but you're never going to be worried about him actually being a movie star. Where were you the first time you saw Entourage? (laughs) Where was I? I was in college, Newcastle University. Uh, I believe I torrented it uh, to watch it on my laptop. And I was like, this is bad because the uh, pilot episode of Entourage is terrible. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone remembers. And then I got really into it and watched uh, at least several seasons of Entourage. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Where were you, Ben? I was at my friend Len's house. Uh, <laughs> I dropped out of school. <laughs> wait, wait. From and, Steal, uh, Steal My Sunshine? Len? The band? You were hanging out with the band Len? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, were you in a basement in New Jersey? Yeah, I was in a basement in New Jersey. <laughs> you dropped Good out call. of college? What are we talking about here? Yeah, yep. I had, uh, I had actually uh, lied to my parents sure. and told them I was still attending college. Wasn't. I was living in Philly in my car. <laughs> This is a whole weird time. You're living time in like, your car? Yeah. You like, have to get on WTF. He has yeah. to lock the gate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I was at Len's house, and he was like, yeah, check the show out. And I, life, li- lifelong fan. <laughs> I've never seen Entourage. Uh, it's a bad TV show. Yeah. Uh, it it's is, but horrible. season season two is okay. It had a moment there. Um, never watched it. Ari you is, never watched it? I've never watched season two. I've seen oh. a handful of episodes. Sure. I mostly watched the Anna Faris arc because that was a period oh, of my life. Oh, that's way later. That's when it's... I know. <sighs> I know. I want, that was the period of my life where I was aspiring to be an Anna Faris Didn't completist. did mom work on Entourage? She, she worked at a casting agency that was working on the sort of New York satellite of Entourage. Okay. Mm-hmm. So most of the casting was being done in L.A., but they had them like scouting for people and doing sessions or whatever. Okay. Um, she didn't successfully just, cast anybody. It's just the least Dauphin show. That's why it's funny. Yeah, I remember her reading it and going, this is terrible. It will never get picked up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ari is men's rights. All right. <clears throat> sure. Okay. So, so she's away, working. Cerulean, but here, yeah. Here's what I want to talk about, because you did this Cerulean monologue, which mm-hmm. is obviously like a bedrock thing. But that, yeah. what I love is the scene where she gets chewed out for something that's not her fault, which is Miranda... Uh, getting not getting on a plane because of a hurricane. Mm-hmm. She's crying, like she sort of flounces off to cry, which we've all done in media. Oh, you're jumping way ahead because this is uh, she's already been there a couple of weeks. This is when the dad comes into town to see Chicago. <laughs> That's right, but no, this isn't that far ahead. This is like 25 minutes into the movie. Okay, uh, if that, uh, and she goes to cry to Stanley Tucci, and rather than him being totally mean or right. him being totally sympathetic and being like, I know Miranda's a handful. He's like, he kind of just sort of like recenters her. He's like, I know you think that this job is just something you're doing and like you deign to do it, 
but it's very important to people and like this magazine is very important to like the to a lot of people like me when i was a kid right which the way he tells that story so fucking good it's like this pocket drop moment where like because the movie i think knows it's combating in the first 30 minutes the percentage of people who are going to write off everything that happens is ridiculous because oh my god the fashion industry it's so self-absorbed it's such a bubble who gives right. a shit yes. yeah yeah and it has these two Giselle monologues Giselle is Emily's friend know, right that's which, a little, fuck yeah. That. yeah that's especially because not she's great. not named Giselle they call her something else she doesn't look she's good Serena. in that her right place? she does not look good no. well they've given her like a bun I know but if you're gonna have Giselle in a yeah. movie like that at least make her look like they're Giselle also, they're not it's, lighting yeah. her well no, what, she's got intense bone structure and the movie clearly knows how to light she looks actresses. like a model, which, right. like, wisely, Emily Blunt doesn't look like a model because she wouldn't be a model because she is – she's a fashion journalist. It's right. a different type of person. Yes. yes yeah. Anyway. Um, right, carry on. No, but those two monologues are really well written. Yep. Without being, like, sort of uh, didactic, you mm-hmm. know? They, they fully kind of undress all the sort of preconceptions you have about the industry and this all being frivolous, the concerns of the movie being stupid. Right. But they're also both – masterfully fucking delivered Mm -hmm. like you've got streep and tucci making direct pleas to the audience to care about the movie right which is like you're never gonna go wrong if you ask those actors to do that yes you could start any movie with stanley tucci being like uh here's why the stakes of this film are important that's what he's doing right and it's so good and that moment where he goes like do you know how many girls would kill for this job like let's say for instance yeah how many right because then he talks about himself right right and that's – you're just like suddenly like, oh, the whole veneer, of course these are like real people. These aren't just stark like archetype, you know, kind of like fashion assholes. Mm-hmm. He's a guy who like this was his life. This is what saved him is that he found this magazine. And that's the success of the movie because the movie because easily just everyone's a villain. Miranda's right. the biggest villain of them all. Could have been. You know, right. That's why it's a good movie. Can we that's talk – yeah, In yes, my point yeah. uh, that I made off Mike to Ben and – Romley was that he he is mean but not cruel if yeah. that makes sense like obviously he, he says a lot of cutting things yeah but he never seems to have a cruel personality it's what he's like figured out about the character yeah without having to do it you know, he's a brilliant actor amazing Stanley actor. Tucci. uh i'm grasped <laughs> grasped by the tooch mm-hmm. can we talk about his head move he does in this so good he's got this very specific gesture he does when he's talking when he's on these like long hyperverbal monologues mm-hmm. Where he like strokes the top of his head, he like rubs the top of his head. He also has the large ring, which I love. The ring is yes. and, and, so and, great, crazy yes. ring. It's very crucial in his betrayal and, scene right at the end when he's right, got the that's ring right I by was his just, face. I was yeah. gonna say it, but I was gonna leave it. No, it's fine. I mean, we can spoil the movie. Miranda Priestly screws over uh, Stanley Tucci's character at the end there. Yeah, uh, Nigel, uh, which is pretty heartbreaking. Yeah, uh, I got but, choked up for the first time. Watching it this time. Yeah. Well, now you're now you're an adult. You and have I, your yeah. own career concerns. No, it's the true, right? You can identify more with what's home. happening yeah. there. Um, but it, the head move is like it's like he's stroking his hair that isn't there, deep in thought. But he does it just very quickly. And in those scenes where he's going on these long monologues to like have some specific physical like business you can do, so it's not just you standing stationary. Like he's always doing shit in this movie. I love that whenever he's giving Andy advice, he's also like approving of shit yeah, so and like that's th- he's also right. Always working. He is playing a character who you understand that Miranda respects him. Right. Even if she's quiet about it, you know, as she would be, right? Yeah. Like she's not someone who lavishes praise upon him. Right. Her biggest praise, I think, is when she's like, someone decided to come to work today at the uh at the editorial meeting. Yes. Right? Um but <laughs> like he defers to her and he's quiet and he's not argumentative, but he also is obviously smart and in charge of shit and independent and, right. you know. And understands her psychology, like understands yes. how to work around her and with her and all of that. Right. Um, so now now Hathaway's in this position. I know we're kind of speeding through this, but Hathaway's yeah. in this position where like. It's not a plotty movie. It's no, not, it's really not. No. Um, these two monologues have been given to her that make her understand, A, why fashion is of some importance, and B, why this job specifically is of some importance. And that's why you really don't resent her for getting into the job. No, because those two monologues are so well delivered that's why that you're it's like— good. Yeah. That's why it's good. Yeah. The two montages in the early part of the movie, the first one is the, oh my God, this job is so hard montage where she's like dropping everything, running around. Yeah. And like, she's oh. Rick the interning. Uh, she's Rick the interning. She really and then is. the second yeah. montage, which is about 35 minutes in, is when she is, her outfits are progressing. She goes to Tucci and she's like, remodel me. See, he gives her a touch of the Tucci. He, that's right. He goes, let me give you just a touch. 
to set you on your way. A boop of the tooch. Uh, tooch boop. Yes. Um, no, yeah. And then and you see her style, sense of style evolving a little bit. Right. And th- that's that's pretty well done the way they keep on using the, the movement to hide the outfit changes. <laughs> pretty well done. I, With, I like, think. clanging pop music. He really, <laughs> like, every time I had to, like, turn my goddamn TV The music's TV down. really bad. The I music forgot is how terrible. bad the music was. Yeah. It's got the worst soundtrack. And I know. And ev- every song sounds the same. Yes. Yes. It sounds like you're in, like, a Uniqlo and pop music is playing over and the And they speakers. also keep on doing, like, other than, than Suddenly I See, they do a lot of the, like, the song drops at the peak of the chorus <laughs> yes. so it's like yes. you're just hearing the iTunes preview version of the song <laughs> maybe that's all they could afford in the city preview. yeah Eddie Vedder did a right. whole soundtrack no that was Into the Wild um, Eddie Vedder Eddie he was, Vedder he was just on Twin Peaks nobody Vedder time. nobody Vedder nobody does it Vedder <sighs> so oh, a lot of people do it better so there's there's this progression to the point where she gets the book right like that's sort of the first Sign that she's doing a good job. Right. Which this movie goes like, let's create the most insurmountable ask of all time. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of. I have, Cause, I have cause some the book trouble. thing. Actually, the book thing annoys me. The book thing annoys me. And what annoys me even more than that is the setup, actually, which Hathaway finally gets tasked with. You get to drop off the book, the book at her brownstone. Another right? annoying uh Townhouse. Another annoying uh, moment is when she's like, what's the book? Anyone would fucking know. Anyone who it. went to journalism school knows what the book is. Anyway. Or also, at this point, context clues. It, sure. Hey, right. Andy, it's a mock-up context of the mag. Clues. Great. You work mm-hmm. at a magazine. Guess. Just take a guess. <laughs> yeah. So, but yes, this is Emily's task and it's now finally being sloughed off right. to uh, Andy, which is to drop off the book right. at and the so- townhouse. You just put the dry cleaning in the closet. You leave the book on the table. Second you leave. floor. It's right. the it's the table with the flowers. Table with the flowers. Right. And she gets up there, and there are a couple different tables with flowers. Oh no! And she's got the dry cleaning, and she's like, "This woman closet? has a master's degree." Right. Just to be clear, which closet? And I don't know. Usually not a ditz, and right. this is like the one ditzy. They and like dial the ditz up. Two too redhead much. twins are like the twins. Yeah, straight from the shining. Two shining <laughs> twins pop up. Yeah, and 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 all of a sudden she just lets go of everything and was like, "Okay, if you say so." They're okay. fucking with her. So yeah. first they give her like what seems like solid advice. They go, like, "The closet's on the left." Right, and she she, she puts, puts it, it in. in. Closet. She's like, "Thanks," and then they're like. She's like, what do I do with the Which book? Which table? Which right. So I feel like those two girls wouldn't get that much of a thrill off of tricking no, an assistant. Absolutely not. No, no. absolutely I, not. Yeah, exactly. Right. But but here's the moment I hate. I if I could do a director's this, this, cut this of this scene film, pisses me off. I would literally cut this. this I did two, fast forward through the scene. When it's I this watched one it. line exchange that drives me insane. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you can you can uh, bring it up to us. No, no, I have to put it on a table. I have to put it on a table. Or uh, sometimes actually. Mom likes it when when people deliver it to her themselves. And then the one twin goes, what? No, she doesn't. And then the other twin looks <laughs> no. at her. And right. she goes, oh, oh, yeah, she does. Yeah, Emily does it all the time. Anne Hathaway is supposed to be a smart person. Master's she degree. Watch them have the conversation where they go, she's no, already, she doesn't. She's already oh, right. killing it at this part. She's doing this a good job. This is pre-killing it. This exactly. is post-killing right. it. Like, if they want to give her the wrong instructions, it should have been played like the way they give her the closet, which is just like, uh, the left, and uh, uh, bring, bring it upstairs. It up. yeah. yeah. Which is ridiculous. There's two tables. Leave it on one of the Leave tables. On one of They're the tables. within eyesight of each other. Yeah. She's She'll see it. At, at the very least, you'll get, like, 5% like shade the next day if you leave it on the wrong table. She's also worked for Miranda Priestley for how long now? Couple and she, weeks at this and point. She a while. somehow believes that if she leaves it, like brings it directly to her, things will go well. I mean, right. as if. And this is just a, you know, narrative device so that we can see Miranda in a fight with her husband to and humanize have Miranda, Andy breach but this. scene is so not It's not necessary. It's there are other necessary. ways you could get to that same yeah. point. Of course. And, and also, you could get to it by the you could Girl's do the exact same her. scene and she just hears the fight. Right, exactly. Whatever. But so the next day, Miranda's like... Miranda's mad. Right. And she's like, um, I need you to get Harry Potter for the girl. She, a- she asks, it's like a, of Hercules, or it's like an impossible task. Right. Get me two copies of, the of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Right. The seventh book. The most closely guarded book in history. Right, which uh, would uh, be impossible to obtain, to be clear. L- literally impossible. I- impossible. Literally, the only person impossible. I believe who got the book was Michiko uh, Kakatani, the New York Times book critic. Uh-huh. And even then, like the publisher was like, "We don't know how she got it." I feel like they so they didn't done even give it out. Anything out? Like it yes. could have been like, "Can you get Manolo Blahnik's new shoes?" You know, sure, anything. They're, but they're trying to do this very specific 
like pop culture like right. thing from the moment, I guess. And I remember when seeing it in the it's, theater, it's annoying. I was like, oh, fuck this, because she's going to get it. Of course she has to get it. Sure. Which is frustrating because it's impossible. It's impossible. And then also there's a ticking clock. Not only, right. They need to be on a train to the grandma's She gets it within a three-hour period. She contacts Simon Baker, who we're going to get to that. And I hope you bring up the detail that drives me insane. Fucking three of them. Yeah, she gets gets, three copies. Contacts Simon Baker. He gets her the book somehow. We'll we'll get to that. Uh, Yeah, she makes three copies, two bound, one unbound. Because she doesn't want it to to, look like a manuscript. Right. Delivers them to an Amtrak train. Yes. And has put on the cover of these bound copies, Harry Potter book seven. Yeah. Which is wild. Don't do that. The kids are going to get it snatched out of their fucking hands. Right. AP bio on it. (laughs) So what's the detail that bugs you? The, the, the fact that she has the time to get them energy to get them bound and, and have them designed. So they look better than the fucking galleys. Also, I, I have a big problem is that when she goes to Miranda and says, I got the books, Miranda's like, Oh, where are they? But the girls were already on the train. Yeah, what was so, like, Miranda so expecting? It, wait, so if if she had given to her them right. there, like it would have been too late. Regard, she it's, doesn't it's seem annoyed when she writing. walks in. Yeah. It's just so you can have the misdirect of oh, so close, but she I fucked actually it up. Uh, got it on the Amtrak. Yeah, it's sort of a it's it's like an Ozymandias reveal. Like what you don't know is I already did it thirty minutes ago. No, but like Miranda is the Ozymandias of this movie, though. In true, Andy's the Ozymandias. And Andy's Night Owl. In true Miranda fashion, if she walked in, she, Miranda should have been like. It's too late. Yeah. Yes. She wasn't like it's too late. Yes, exactly. Yes. And she, she, I don't even know why you're here because, yeah. yeah. Two trees, four track? Uh, sure. Emily's Dr. Manhattan. I don't know. <laughs> oh, Tucci's Manhattan. Blunt yeah. is worse. Yeah. yeah, that sounds more. Yeah. Right. Um, she, I, whatever. Okay. And so- the way she gets it is Simon Baker, who's playing, I don't know what he's supposed to be in this. He's supposed to be like some cross between like the most celebrated like travel journalist alive and like some sort of scarf wearing like fashion hipster i can't tell if he's perfectly cast or really miscast i think he's miscast but like i feel like weird in a in a weird way that's what that guy would look like a little bit any guy who's really celebrated writer but also is in the fashion industry i think he needs to be like a little more rugged like but Uh we were me and joanna were really debating this like what what who should it be like who's the because Joanna thinks he's just unattractive. I think that's crazy. He's a pretty guy. He just looks... He's the mentalist, for God's sake. He's, but look, I he don't the think he... To go from Adrian Grenet to him, it's like, I feel like she wouldn't... I, yeah. You know, it's it's very far. The, there, there's a long walk between those the two. The character type is kind of a, a big reach, too. Because it's yes. essentially like, what if you had, like, a journalist who mostly did short form, like, like magazine pieces, right. but with the sort of renowned and cultural import of, like, a gay Talese, you know? Yeah, or that's like, right, 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 right. Or, like, a pretty, Thomas Wolfe, you know, at their peak. pretty gay. He seems pretty gay, but then also what if he Scarfed. looked like a fucking adventurer? Right, but only a little bit. And, like, why is he so interested in Andy? Like, I get right. that he wants yeah. to have sex with her, but, like, if he's this famous... Yeah, so like he, I, I don't know. He, yeah, at the point where he gets her the manuscript, like there isn't even that much flirtation going on between them. It's They've like met he, once, yeah. and he offered to read. He really her wouldn't do work. that for her. Yeah, and then she calls him. He's on the street, standing on a random like, street I, corner. She's like, I, "I'm sorry, but like I really need Harry Potter book seven. And he's like, "Oh yeah, well you know that's impossible." And then he calls back. And he's like, "You know what? I have this buddy who's like an agent or friend whatever. of my friend does the drawing. Yeah, that's it. And like they have a galley. Which, come on, the guy who does the drawings wouldn't even be able to get it himself. Right. Like, I'm glad we spent this much time on this. Yeah, it, it, no, because you have to. It's, it's one tough. of the worst parts. Yeah, uh, it's a perfect movie, but it's... but then she nails it. She does nail it, so she's passed. She's, or I guess she's relieved herself of her failure. She's invincible, and now like Streep knows her name. She's Andy now. She's, she's not Emily. Yes, yes. You know, because everyone keeps on saying this is the new Emily. This is my Emily. 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 No, she's got a name now. Right. And I guess not long after is the the Met Ball type event that right. they have where they're flanking her. She was not supposed to go. Reminders. Usually, only first assistant goes. Right. I didn't even and pick it. That is the Met Ball. It's the Met Ball, right? Yeah. I think so. And like Granny I dares have his birthday on the same day as the Met Ball, which, in my opinion, Four he should have addressed. Yes, like right, because it's at problem. the Natural History Museum. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, okay. I actually blame his parents for that. Yeah, they. They should have induced Labor Day earlier. Exactly. <laughs> um, 
So she, so gets she misses into his it. birthday. I also hate the how she's like, I'm so late for his birthday. I'm like, it's the Met Ball. What is it? One in the morning? Like, yeah, you're not yeah. going to make it. Right. Like, she should have just stopped that. And yeah, like, hopefully I'll it won't be in. here too late. You're going to miss dinner. You yeah. know, yeah. <laughs> it's an evening affair. Right. A black tie evening right. affair. But she oh, does. I'm sorry. I missed the day of your birthday. Why don't we just have a party the next day? Yeah, the exactly. Day before, how hard is this? Like, baby. And this goes from birthday like, Benny himself. But also, and, he yeah. knew that she was going to the Met Ball. So yeah. he shouldn't have been so surprised. Well, no, because the idea is they kind of sprung it on her. And they sprung right? it know, on her, but, but come on. But come they on. sprung but it on her on. at like, it, it was still light know. outside. That day. Yeah. Yeah. Earlier and, that day. And like, yeah, his the worst thing he does, in my opinion, is where he's like, you look very pretty. I think that's so shitty. That is incredibly passive aggressive. Yeah. Yes. Even by his standards, he is a And the way he delivers that line, line is yeah. just bad. He I'm almost like, is Grenier doing a good job? Because, like, am I supposed to be this pissed off about it? Or is he, does he think he's sympathetic? That's my question. Like, this is a weird movie in that a lot of the ways, a lot of the things that elevate it feel like mistakes. Sure. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, not to give credit, but it's like, the movie ends up being more interesting because Grenier sucks so much. Mm -hmm. Because it is such a workplace comedy. If they tried to play up the romance more, he, it would yeah. take away from the, what the movie is really character. about. He's just like right. a thing to represent that she is getting sucked into the job. Like, he's not really, it's just right. like there are scenes with him, so now we know that, oh, she's neglecting her boyfriend. But if someone yeah. actually charming was in the role, then he'd be like, ah, oh, fuck, maybe she should be spending more time with her boyfriend. The point of the movie is that, like, he fucking sucks. Like, he he shouldn't be taking her away from this also, great job. I agree, also, and they don't get back together, right? No. No. They don't, He's right? also a chef at Bubby. He's busy. You yeah. work long fucking hours yes, at Bubby's. Yes, you do. And, and probably, here's that never comes up, because no. it seems he's always at home making time, Arlsberg grilled cheese. But every cheese. time that they, they meet outside the restaurant, it's clearly late at night. Yeah, yeah it must three be like, in the morning. Yeah. Exactly. That, that place is open late. Yeah, yes. I, that's I've one of its like, big draws, right. that John it's open Stewart's really late. John Stewart's always there. Right. I, I distinctly remember eating like French toast there at four o'clock yeah. in the morning once. Wow, you're such a cool guy. Thank you. That was one of my four cool nights. <laughs> <laughs> I distinctly remember it because it was one of the four nights where I was like, look at me being cool in New York City. Yeah, NYC, yeah. baby. Yeah, I'll take a screwdriver with that French toast, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that oh, was no. when I stopped being cool. <laughs> the person I was with was like, what the fuck are you doing? Did you actually get a screwdriver? Yeah. Oh. Great. Um, You're always almost cool. I know. <laughs> that, that's a top ten moment on the podcast right there. <laughs> That's right up there with Alan Burson telling you to try silence. <laughs> you get to the place to be cool and right, then you yeah. just do just, one yeah. thing. He, like the dismount is wrong, essentially. Yeah. yeah. It's like you're doing the whole gymnastics routine. Everyone's like, this is it. He's I gonna, think you're he's very gonna cool. Wink. I You've always been it. cool. Okay. Oh, Griffin's very cool. Yeah. Griffin's I so am cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's a super. Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. I am a super. But perhaps the most uncool superhero. Okay, okay thank you. So. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, he sucks. And also both of their fight scenes before the final fight where they mm -hmm. break up are ended with her being like, I know, I know. Do you want to have sex? Which is sort <laughs> yeah. of like, all right. No, but when, when, when she's like, do you like, do you like yeah. this new necklace? He's yeah. like, yeah. I liked your old necklaces. And, and then, he's like, yeah, she's yeah. like wearing this beautiful ensemble. And he's like, mm, whatever. Right. I don't like but that. The first, I like when she's like, frumpy. check this okay, out. But this is bad because the first Shows time he sees her. designer bustier. Yeah, The first time he sees her. After she's gotten the makeover, he's like, I better get you out. Like, you look so fucking amazing. Yeah, my girlfriend's like, my girlfriend gonna, sees yeah. us. Right. And, and then, then the she second does the time, he's like, she's like, I, I like your old clothes better. And it's yeah. like, no, you fucking the don't. Andy I knew. Do not her. like yeah. the he's lapis <laughs> sweater yeah. more than this, like, you know, yeah, like terrible dress. haircut. Yeah. Like, he's no, the classic, you, like uh, you know, girl, you don't need makeup. Uh, guy, right? right? Like you know, no, you look beautiful. And he's, you know, and it's just like leave her alone. Like she looks great. He just feels threatened. He, he feels threatened. Like I feel like when the Fox executives like saw the first cut of this movie, they were like, oh, "It's really good. It's too bad that Grenier thing doesn't work. We really wanted a strong romantic subplot." But the movie is better because the romantic it subplot is. sucks. I think that's true. I yeah. Yes. Like I think that wasn't what they intended. It's, maybe it is a. Purely career movie. And we were talking. No, that's right. This that's isn't a rom-com. Right. That's yes. the thing is like, I think they probably want a movie that was a little more half and half. Obviously, there's a little less focus on the romance, even just in how it's written than most movies like this. Yeah. But like, I watched 9 to 5 on the plane. Sure. Classic. And, and I had like 17 hours to watch like a bunch of movies. Sure. And I watched both 9 to 5 and Devil Wars Prada was available on the plane, very coincidentally. 
Uh, and so I watched those. I believe two. it's available on all planes. I at think all it's times. the ultimate yes. plane movie. Yeah. Um, I'm not back to back, but I watched them within one contained metal tube ride. Sure. And I was like, this is a genre that doesn't really exist anymore, and that has never really gotten its due, which is like the workplace comedy, which is purely just a workplace comedy, and especially right. female driven workplace comedies always are well how do i balance my family and or my relationship and i watched a movie recently which sucked Mm -hmm. you know what it is but um do you not want to drag the movie no 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 i'm gonna tell you but i'm saying it's similar it's with hathaway the intern oh sure i think that intern's kind of good okay okay, but i do think that is a a workplace exactly that is a workplace movie that is a workplace movie. I think the movie fails when it gets into her marriage. The marriage, I know, for but, similar but it's not a romance. Right. No. Right. No. no. But that, and there's no romance in the movie. And you know what? That's exactly what I like about the intern. The two yes. things I like about the intern, for all of its failings, are that it's a workplace movie and that's a movie about a friendship. Right. There's a lot. And to, a guy being an asshole. Right. Like a husband. Yeah. Oh, God, he sucks in that movie. That's another husband who feels threatened. He's yeah. he's right. He's like Grenier times ten. Yeah. yeah. He's like Grenier if Anne Hathaway in this movie decides to uh, you know uh, procreate with him. Yeah. Fuck Durs. Uh, he's really awful. so, but alongside that is Paris, right? Which we know from the beginning that Emily Emily's number is one dream. All she's for. been doing go to fashion is, week, is England for Paris, working up to Paris her entire career. And Miranda, after Emily screws up the uh, naming one of the guests at the Met Ball type, and event. also let's remember earlier that day, Emily's sick. She comes into office. Yeah, she's like coughing, and coughing, another, red nose, looks like Steve Bannon. Another good thing they do there <laughs> is that when, uh. Uh, Hathaway gets the name right. Instead of Blunt being pissed that she stole her thunder, right? She says thank you. They're teammates. Yes, now. they are teammates. That's now. really That's good. True, which right makes the betrayal a little harder. Right. Obviously, she gets hit by a cab. Right. Uh, but so let's just. But I like ha- that ha- her getting hit by yeah. Kip does not let Andy off the hook. No, Andy Me still too. has to say, right. "I'm going to Paris right. so, without you." So Sorry. Blunt gets sick. Miranda's freaks out by it when she comes in the office, wheezing, coughing, which. You, it's sort of implied that's why she wants Andy there because she's not really feeling super comfortable around Emily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then Andy knocks it out of the park, gives the name, wins over both of them in one fell swoop. Sure. Makes allies of both Miranda and Emily. Yeah. And then Miranda gives her the death blow, which is you're coming to Paris with me. Right. I need the best around me. And, and that no longer that, includes and Emily. make sure to tell Emily. You got to tell Emily. Which if I'm Anna Wintour, that's how I would operate. 100%. Yeah, I know. I think I'm not that's doing realistic. any awkward shit. Yeah. Keeps her hands clean. But puts Andy in an impossible situation. She's making the phone call. Tough news. Boom. Hit by a car. I think True. the scarf in the air thing is stupid. Yeah, I was the scarves say, flying that in is the air. the definition of too much paprika on yeah, the sandwich. That is Frankel being like, oh, I have a good idea. No, you don't, Frankel. Nope. nope that no. was very 27 dresses. Yes. Mm. And it's like 80 scarves. And they're in slow motion. And it's like, and everyone's like, Hermes scarves. Fuck out of here. We yeah. all have free scarves now. Uh, the scene in the hospital, I think, is Blunt's best scene. Great scene. Yeah. Um, and I, I talked in the past about watching uh, Martin Short eat pudding and how it was like, man, this is a good actor. You know how well he eats pudding. Blunt eats pudding so well in this scene. And you know what's good, too? It's and the, the carbs. It's She's the mark the of a real but also, fucking artist. The second Andy says, you're not going to Paris, she starts eating all this shit because yeah. she hasn't been eating. Yeah, and she's finally like, "Fuck it." There's nothing. I have nothing to look forward to. I'm not right. gonna wear the clothes. There's scabs all over my face. I'm in a hospital bed. Like, I'm gonna eat fucking carbs. And masterstroke when she right. says, "Like, you're fat. You eat carbs." And she's eating bread as right. she says that. Um, there's a move though where Blunt like angrily tries to rip the lid off the pudding, but accidentally so only rips half the lid. So good. And there isn't too much attention drawn to it, but then you see her go for the second half of the lid with even more frustration, mm-hmm. and then takes a big globful and delivers all this like. She's she's so frustrated because Half she realizes tearful. she's gotten beaten. She doesn't even hate Andy anymore. No, she no. hates the fact that Andy seems to have out Emily'd her. Right. Yeah. She sort of hates her her shortcomings as yes. an employee more right. than she hates Andy. Right. She's pissed at Andy, but like in a more like you're quickly gonna forgive. You should have said yeah. no. You should have said yeah. No. Um. So she goes to Paris. She does. Yeah. I don't know. This is it's interesting because the movie is about an hour fifty minutes. Yeah, they only go to Paris with about twenty five minutes left in the movie, mm-hmm. and at this point, it introduces a huge subplot yeah. that it almost immediately resolves. Yeah, yeah, uh, that is almost feels like they're in search of a an ending for the movie. I guess I mean I assume it's right in the book, 
Uh, uh, I don't know. It just book. feels like a conflict that's brought in very late to add some stakes. Because, like, to summarize, and we can dig in, but, like, it's like she goes to Paris. She sleeps with Simon Baker. She sees that he's, like, part of some sort of Her and of has sort of takeover. broken up. I feel like yeah, that's definitely up. not in the book. Is it not? I mean, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, no offense, I, I Lauren. But, and then, yeah, she sleeps with Simon Baker, finds out this info, tries to tell Miranda... And then, and also, she's found out the news at Paris that Stanley Tucci is going to like take this job with Daniel Sunyata's uh, fashion right. designer guy. Which, God, that guy is so charming. Love I almost Daniel want to play so like the Simon Baker. Role. Charming. I, I was a big hit, fan of him because he's so good in Rescue Me, the yeah. uh, FX drama about firefighters. And then, if you uh, played Simon Mar- Baker, you would it would be very believable. You and and that opening yeah. scene, but he, he is well her. cast though as the kind of like yeah he's slippery, he, uh, right. sort of Tom Ford esque, like quite yeah, handsome, I, yeah. well put together. Yeah. yeah, God, he's so good looking. He's I just so when he came on screen, handsome. I was like, fuck I know. that. That's too good a face <laughs> for one in, uh, person to have. He's in The Dark Knight Rises. Yes. Yeah. Do you know he also narrated? The like director's cut of Loose Change, the 9-11 conspiracy documentary. <laughs> uh, yes, he is a uh, 9-11 truther, which they build into his character in Rescue Me. Really? Because he used to piss off the actors so much with that shit. Right. They were like, we should make, I mean, you're a firefighter. We yeah. should make you a 9-11 truther. And, and I think you piss that's off his the explanation is that like in doing research for Rescue Me mm-hmm. and like finding out about firefighters, he started going down the rabbit hole and seeing the truth about the steel beams. <sighs> Look, Hour Daniel. Seven, though. Hour seven. I don't know what that means, and I tower don't care to. Seven. Um, oh, well. tower seven. Uh, okay, so and like it's just like a lot, you know. It's like scene after yeah. scene. It's like, oh, the hostile takeover is happening. Oh, she's trying to run it off. Oh, Miranda's diffused it by you know moving her French rival to this once. Uh, job. It's at the Met Ball. Yeah, you see it for a they second. Say, like, she's like, oh, she hates French. her. She yes. runs French runway. I mean, Miranda there have always been rumors. There, there was like a, there was definitely a moment where the editor of French Vogue was considered to be like. Horning in on Anna Wintour's sure. character. I think that is that is inspired. She's well cast. She looks Was like... that John Julia Buck in real life? Is that who that's meant to be? No, it's Kareen Rodefeld. Okay. Yeah. Uh sure. I just got rammed. Famously, <laughs> uh so the rumor was always that like fashion people were told, Don't you dare cameo in this movie. Like that's like really? a hit on Anna Wintour. Uh, uh and they're not a ton like Valentino's in right, it. Right. Uh, I think Heidi Klum shows up for a second. Like, there's not a lot yeah. of, like, big... It's not like Zoolander, you know? And you know what I love that Valentino does, which is, like, so, like, real fashion designer? And I guarantee you this wasn't written dialogue. This was them being like, hey, Valentino, talk like, to them. Yeah, just wit. chat for a second, right. right. When he meets Andy, he she goes like, hi, this is Andy, my new Emily. And he goes, oh, did you love the show? The, like, presumptive, like, I'm not going to ask you what you thought. I'm going to ask you if you loved it or yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is very fashion to me. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. So which of my pieces was your favorite? You know, yeah, the, like, exactly. I assume that you respect what I did already. Um, according to Wikipedia, Ivanka Trump is in this movie. I didn't spot her. <laughs> I didn't either. No. Anyway. So, but like, so the Paris thing just feels very sudden. Oh, you know why you didn't see her? Because she thinks the way that she could help the movie the most mm. is to sort of like stay in the shadows and just be a quiet ally. <laughs> it's just searing, like you don't see her in the commentary. Movie. You don't see her in the movie, but she's actually fighting really hard for like the right things in the movie. Like anything that's good in the movie actually is no, her responsibility. No, no. And anything that's bad in the movie, she was like telling them not to do. She believes in all the right things. Yes. Uh, great. But she didn't want the credit. Thank you. She just wants to spend her political, political he, he capital did wisely. Uh, five political commentary points. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. What do we have to say? I mean, why she sleeps with Simon Baker? I'd sleep with him, but like he's never really a threat. No, I don't like it when he's walking around shirtless. Yeah, his, he's a little his, too confident. His torso is a little weird. Yeah, exactly. Can I also say his first scene in the movie, and this has struck me every time I've watched it. Just his first scene, just when they meet at the first party. Sure. His eyebrows are too yellow. I really didn't notice. He does have his uh, eyebrows are weirdly blonde. He's Australian. I think it's like he is. Yes, I'm a baker. Yeah, so he's got the the sun. His accent's very good. You mentioned it. He sort of looks like the lion from the Wizard of Oz. Yes, he does. He's got that vibe. Yes, he does. But I think his eyebrows are less (sighs) yellow in every other scene. It's Hmm. just that first scene. I don't know. Maybe it's always bugged me. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, But she sleeps with him. He reveals to her. That he's known about this takeover the entire yeah, time because they're gonna, he's like, going to be head of editorial. Sure. Okay. I think he really gives her too much. Way too much. Way yeah, too flippantly. He reveals his plan very quickly. 
And it's also like to Miranda's assistant. Right. And he does it like, yeah, of course. What do you expect? Yeah. He doesn't do the like, oh shit, you've caught me. And oh, he no. also doesn't do my the mock like, up of the new runway. Right. <laughs> that I had. Right. I, I have this this styrofoam poster board in my knapsack, in my rucksack. Along with forty other scarves. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but but like the two obvious versions of this scene are either that, like, oh shit, fuck, you caught me. Okay, well now that I'm backed in a corner, I gotta tell you I'm part of this thing. Or the other version is, hey, baby, that's how it works. Like, I've been using you the yeah. entire time. Yeah. You don't think I've been juicing you for info? Sure. But, but it's neither. Do either. It's more just like, oh, yeah, this is how the it's business just works. Like, yeah, casual. <laughs> yeah. I, I, just, I casually suck. <laughs> and then she goes into, like, okay, into shit, high stakes. Mode. I got to save Miranda. Uh, but uh, that's all pointless. But we Miranda should mention that there is also the scene where Miranda announces the divorce to her. And she's uh, the other with no makeup moment. on, no makeup. She's a little bleary she's eyed. Got the bags under the eyes. Yeah, and, and she's talking about how there you know, goes Paige the dragon lady. Write about another, her, right. Right. right? Yeah, that was good. It's like, that's the scene you. Won't, that's really the only scene you need. Yeah, you don't really it. need the. And other the second scene. you yeah. see that scene, you're like, "Fuck the book scene." Yeah, fuck the fuck book the scene. Book. Yeah. Just get it out of there. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, but that's like that's the, the sort of. Uh, uh, th- that's the scene that elevated uh, Streep from like Oscar nominee to like almost one. Uh, yeah. Agreed. That's agreed. the scene that adds like the, the attic course. and the basement onto the yeah. house and really deepens the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> that's the basement. You well, know what makes well, it well put. Right? Do you know what I'm saying? Well put. I agree. A finished basement too. It's a finished basement. It finishes the basement. Yes. Um. Um. What, then what, she yeah. betrays Tucci. That's the final. That's the final thing right. we have to Tucci talk about. Tucci has that scene. The Shiv and Tucci side, where he tells Andy the news. He pours her the champagne. He tells Does her great the news. job in that scene. Yeah, where he's very excited. And now he's just yeah, like a giddy sort of little like, boy. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. he has that thing where he looks out the window and he's like, "Oh my god, I get to make my own decisions in my life again. I get to go to Paris and actually be in Paris." Mm-hmm. Like the whole cool, steely, like cold demeanor kind of, is dropped. Right, right. right he's right. just a giddy little boy. And it's like this is what I've wanted to do my entire career. Sure. That's that's the Shakespearean tragedy in the middle of this story, is yeah. that she throws his body on the grenade. Basically, it's yeah. like okay. Upon analyzing this movie, you do realize there are like eighteen different plot lines. A lot of plot lines. Yeah, a lot. And no, like I, the only through plot line is like, will Andy be corrupted by the right. world of fashion media? Yeah. And then at the end, it's like, no. Yeah, she'll not be all right. Really? Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, the end of the movie is she quits, outraged at this betrayal. Right. And goes and gets a job at a newspaper, and uh, Miranda well. gives her a good recommendation. Which okay. she had never done before. But also, one thing that I find a little annoying, sure. just because I wish that she would stay at Runway, uh-huh. but when she's like, she kind of writes off the fact that she left, when she's like, oh, mm-hmm. I don't know why I did that. Or she says something to the interviewee. Where yeah, she's, she's learned like, a lot. She's kind of screwed it up at the end. Yes. Yeah. Or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, do you regret not staying at Runway? Sure. Yeah, she, she, because she seems so confident in her decision when it's happening. True, right. she throws her right. phone in the right. and fountain. It's so a thing, which yeah. is littering. P.S. <laughs> throwing a fucking phone in the fountain. Yeah, that was a little yeah. much. Yeah, and also it's not like that was just her work phone. No, that's true. It's just her it's like just phone. Her phone. It's like a sidekick or yeah. something. This is the phone. The razor becomes the hot phone before yeah. when this movie comes out. That's not a phone people can own. The razor. Was, yeah, the razor oh, was, was like uh, designed for this I movie. Yeah, really mm. wanted a sidekick. Yeah. She has a sidekick. She has a sidekick. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Anne Hathaway has a yeah. sidekick. I people got a razor. Uh, I think as a lot of people did. It was yeah. a popular no, phone. No, I really wanted a sidekick. It's crazy to think that I used that thing. They, they were so horribly designed. Weird. Yeah. I almost bought a sidekick on eBay. <sighs> you almost a bought a sidekick story. on eBay recently? No, no. I, like oh, went, like time. around this time. Okay. Because AT&T didn't sell sidekicks. So I tried to do this whole thing where you got an unlocked sidekick. When you were like nine? So yeah. that was the thing. Hot huh, movies. They would be like, new cell phone yeah. alert. Phone. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not anymore. I mean, no, I haven't seen like now, an iPhone. Now it's just yeah. iPhone models. Right. Now the yeah, difference well, is probably like, some movie where someone has like a Galaxy Note. I don't know. And I then guess. you'd probably yeah. watch and be like, really? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like Android. There's, yeah. really? What did I just see where someone had a Windows phone? And I'm like, I was like, they wouldn't have a Windows phone. <laughs> well, it's like you know how how Sony movies always work Sony products into sure, them, sure. right? Right. So like, uh, famously in the Amazing Spider Man, when Spider Man is trying to solve the case, figure out who the lizard is, right? He keeps on binging it. He keeps on using. Microsoft Bing. So I watched, it's just like Peter Parker wouldn't use Bing. No, I don't remember what Bing. movie I watched, but I watched a movie the other day, and the main character had a, a type of car that they wouldn't drive if if the movie was realistic. Like a PT and then they put 
Then they put the name of the car on oh, the car. Oh, hey man, and I was like, money. that would yeah. never, like, yeah. that is just, yeah, that's but that was like 15% move. of the budget. Yeah, yeah exactly. They, yeah. They, all right. I really want to play the box office game because I didn't know about this weekend. I remember this weekend vividly. Right. I didn't know about it. It's a great weekend. But is there anything else about the Devil Wears Prada that we have not covered? I mean, is there, Rom, is there anything? I mean, just the smile at the end. Smile at the end, right, of course, yeah. last scene. Yeah. Uh, is Andy sees Miranda right. across the street. Yeah. Also, one thing I will say, and this will close it out, is that when, at the end, they, it's a very conscious choice to dress her the way they do because she's mm-hmm. not poorly dressed. She sure. just clearly so she is not good. working for a fashion magazine. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, she gives, um, and she gives her clothes then, to Renee, Emily, we Renee should say. Renee is like, you're wearing that. And it's like, that outfit is really... Like, really if you go back to what she wore in the beginning, yeah. like, that outfit's wildly fashionable. She looks like a movie star. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she does. But she does give Emily her surplus Paris Fashion Week clothes. Right. Yeah. As a peace offering. Emily's the Big best. shoes to fill. Yeah, you have big shoes to fill. She's just some poor scared lady. Yes. yes. I hope you know that. Um, uh, what I was going to say, one thing I give this movie credit for doing is uh, not having Andy write The Devil Wears Proud at the end. Ooh, uh, oh, so, if right? they did Very that, because they could have done that. Because then re- she would seem like a petty. Also, yes. agree. <laughs> yes. If they did that, I can promise you, I would not have seen it ten times. Yeah. No, the movie yeah, would have left true. a really bad taste in your mouth yeah. if that's how it ended. Right. So because the movie is better than Lauren Weisberger in that. Yeah, it is. Right. Right. Yes. She doesn't like grind. And, and, and yeah. I've never right. even the thought that she writes it. Right. Like never comes into my mind. Right. Which I th- I think is the smartest yeah. choice this movie makes. Yeah, the true. single smartest choice. Yeah. Okay, box office game. So I had been going to the same summer camp for years and years and years. We've talked about it. And then worked there for a little while. And this was like the first summer in like eight or nine years that I hadn't gone there. It whatever was it was. July 4th weekend, 2006. So it had been the first summer five years I had gone there. Sure, sure. And I went to Paris for a month, the motherland where, where our mother is from. Sure, Gay uh, Perry. To stay with her uh, childhood friends. When I was in Paris in high school, when I would go there, I would stay with her high school ex-boyfriend. Your mother's high school ex-boyfriend? And his family. And I always thought that the wife in the family was my mom's friend and that he was just— Me too. I didn't realize Oh, you didn't put it together later. No, Uh no, 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 no. Yeah. And then I would, like—they had, like, two teenage daughters. I would hang out with them when I was there. And then they would, like, when they introduced me to friends, be like, it's weird. It's like we could have been siblings in a different world. Yeah, they— And I was like, what? Except I had to pretend, like, haha, yes, I've known this all along. They sure, stayed sure. at our house in, in New York, and they were like, oh, well, we could have been sisters. And I was yeah, like, what are you I don't talking? understand. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I was living for a month with my mother's high school boyfriend. <laughs> Absolutely. Not even high school. It was like 20. Like the, they were together for a long time. proposed to her. I didn't know that. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah, she said it's no, It's good that we're getting Griffin mom talk, because it's usually Griffin dad talk. Our, our, dad mom's fuck, our mom's crazy. I mean, were like, you about to say fucked up? No, 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 no. I'm just saying, like... <laughs> No, 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 no. There's a lot of stuff there. No, no. The the thing about our mom is that we're constantly, every day, it's like, wait, you were a ballerina dancer in Russia? That's, a, that's like, an example we always throw out. There's a lot of it. There, there. There's a lot of stuff that our mom doesn't tell us. That Yes, that she was a ballerina dancer in Russia, and I've never seen her dance in my entire life. Like, I've never seen her dance at a party. I don't know if that's right. true, but I just threw that out. But, like, there are things but like I that all the time. I telling me that. I know she did Shakespeare in Russia yeah, at some no, no, point. But she spoke uh, Russian and lived there? No, our, 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 mom's, spoke our mom in has lived, like, 18 lives. Sure. Yeah, she just And most of them are secret. Right. So that's why this is unsurprising and funny. Right. Uh, but so I so was, you were in gay I was living with them. Uh, so it was like this one summer I was kind of like disconnected with American movies yeah. in a way. And I, I was watching the box office very closely from afar. And I had gone to see a screening. I was like so amped for the movie that was number one the weekend. The Devil Wears Prada came out. It was Tell my me. most anticipated movie of the summer. It was Mine called too. Superman Returns. Correct. And Brian Singer I, film. I knew I was going to Paris. It wasn't coming out in France until like a month or two later because sure. this was still. That was back in the day before the global rollout. Yeah. Right. So we all went to go see that as a family because I worked every angle I could to like get a screening before uh, sure, sure. I went away to France um, and thought that it was going to be the movie of the summer. It's a, it's a wonderful movie. A movie I really like. Yep. A movie that would be a masterpiece if you changed one piece of casting, which we've talked about. We disagree, but go, go ahead. Um, Wait, do we? Who is it? Rachel McCam should have played Lois Lane. I mean, that's good casting. But, but anyway, I like, Kate I like yeah. Kate Bosworth. I like Kate Bosworth. Yeah, yeah. In that movie. Anyways. Yes. Um, One of my hottest takes. I think she's bad in that movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like that movie a lot. Uh, and then the opening weekend of this film. Right. This movie, I think, was 
intended just as like easy counter programming to what was going to be the obvious juggernaut. Everyone was like, and oh, it Superman did a lot Returns. better, and Superman Returns didn't do quite as well. Like, and people were like, know. oh, it siphoned some of the money away from Superman. Because right. Superman Returns opens on July 4th weekend, so a uh-huh. five day weekend to $76 million. It's a lot of money. Yes. Uh, Devil Wears Prada opens to 40, which is a huge, its budget was 35. So it like, you know, in an opening weekend, it outdoes its budget. That's humongous. Because even like the biggest estimates at the time were like, this might break out. It might do 25 opening weekend. Sure. And then it opens to 40. Yeah, it makes 124 domestic, uh, 325 total. Right. Worldwide. A lot of money. A lot of money. And I read an interview with Brian Singer recently where they ask him to, like, assess Superman Returns and what he thinks went wrong there in terms at least of, of public reception and, and box office, which, weird thing to think about, Superman Returns made almost the exact same amount as Batman Begins. Sure. Like, they both made, yeah, like, but, 200 right. on the nugget. Yeah. Batman Begins, there was a demand, and then the second one blew up. Superman Returns, they kept on debating whether or not to do another know, one yeah. for years, but it just there wasn't the same sort We'll of, get to it. We'll do that movie someday. We'll do I mean, someday. that movie has a very weird pitch. Agreed. Yeah. But... Part of the weird pitch he said was, he said, I thought if you could marry a superhero movie to a romantic comedy, make sure. a superhero movie, not a romantic comedy, romantic a romantic drama. Yes. If you could invest a superhero movie with real romance, that it would be bigger, it would be like the Titanic of superhero movies, and you'd get a female audience in a way you hadn't for other superhero films. And he said the problem was women just wanted to see Devil Wears Prada instead. Yeah. Sorry, Brian. Like, also, you did a weird job with that. Agreed. In my opinion. That's the weakest part of the movie. I think it's interesting, but it's definitely not a romance, like, in the no. conventional But that terms. was his goal, and then Devil Wears Prada, like, he thought, oh, I'll make a movie that, like, crosses the aisle. Sure. And instead, every woman was like, this is our fucking Superman. I mean, that movie's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That Devil Wears Prada is a huge surprise hit. Okay, so that's number two. What's number three, though? It's a fantasy comedy, sort of. It's a fantasy. But like, but it's a grounded real world comedy with a fantasy element. Uh starring one of the big stars of comedy of Click? the uh, Yes. Click. <laughs> Click. Adam Sandler gets a remote control yes. with, really with which movie. to control his like the terrible movie. My first was guess was gonna be click, and then you said grounded. Well, but you know I what I mean? It's like it's just yes. about a it's fucking one guy. Weird yes. Yeah, right. Yes. A Frank Karachi pick. Uh, Frank Karachi, who you've worked with. I just worked with. Uh, yeah. 137 domestic that movie makes. Uh, yeah. Big hit. Big hit. Makes more than Dead of Warriors Prada. Yeah, that's crazy to think about. Great scene where Terry Crews lip syncs to a song and he mutes him. The, the crazy only good thing scene. is, Dead of Prada, we're still talking about. No one talks about uh, Yeah. People don't talk as much about Click. People talk People about don't click? talk no. as much about Click. No. <laughs> No, no, number really. four is a, a silly baby <laughs> movie that I'm sure you saw. Uh, Cars. Yeah, <laughs> I saw it too. Sure. I thought yeah. it was good time. Yeah. Well, you were you were the right age. I think it still has its qualities. <laughs> yeah, but you it don't like Cars quality. two or three. I think Cars two is garbage. I think Cars three is one of the most eh movies ever made. It's sure. like fine. Cars right, three is right, so right. aggressively fine. But isn't that kind of what Cars is? Cars is pretty aggressively I think cars, fine. The first Cars has some really substantial plot lines. Lines. It's a very stupid plot line. The world building is terrible. Uh-huh. I think Cars 1 has elements that feel like full Pixar power. I agree. Like sure. there are characters, there are scenes, there are themes. There are moments where I'm like, this is Pixar fighting at full power. Yeah. And then there's stuff that's dumb. Cars 3 feels like a solid DreamWorks movie. Yeah. Like right, it right. feels like a Forgettable. double. You'll it's never, not right. bad, but yeah. it's like fine. I'm it's got sure. one moment that's kind of effective. Cars 2 is a garbage fire. Number five is uh, comedy. That haven't said I saw Cars four times in theater. You're, yeah. you're, this summer I saw it four. I remember seeing it again. Outrageous. I remember seeing it again in France because I wanted to see how well it translated. How but well are, did it translate? Yeah. The character's name is Flash McQueen in French. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Flash answer. McQueen. Ka-chow. Number five is a comedy that is a follow-up to one of the biggest, like, the director's follow-up to one of the biggest comedy hits. Uh, not, not in terms of money made, but in terms of impact. Interesting. Uh, it uh, actually was kind of a hit. It certainly outgrossed its budget um, by many times. But it wasn't as big as the, the previous film. It, I think it's more of, like, a weird niche movie that some people really love. Uh, fuck. Big it. comedy director. Does it have a big so, comedy star in it? Yes. Yeah. Had he worked with that star before? Was no. this a team? This okay. was his second movie, as far as I know. This oh, first movie is like oh, a little indie movie. Oh, yeah. this is a movie that I really like, that I think is really good, that has stood the test of time. I think it's far better than his original film. It's called Nacho Libre, starring Jack Black. Correct. 
I think Jared it's Hess. It. I I think it's a, so many a movies secret I've little seen masterpiece. Just yeah. because of you, it's Griffin. Yeah, I, I used to see the movies. Yeah. We used to go see movies a lot. Uh, Nacho Libre, uh, which made eighty just million dollars. The fact that I saw Nacho Libre in theaters. That's why. I saw it. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah, yeah. I saw it with you. Yeah. Uh, I think it was really good. It was a really big hit. And then he like, I feel like people forget that movie was successful. Yeah, they think of it as a flop, but it wasn't. They think it of it as fine. like a one hit wonder kind of guy, Jared Hess. Uh, Jared Hess, who then made Gentleman Broncos, Gentleman Broncos which, which was barely a flop. Comes out. Yeah. And then Masterminds. Right. And he did another one that barely came out Don too. Don Verdine. Yeah. Never heard of it. Right. Other movies, uh, you got The Lake House. Keanu and Sandra reunited, mm-hmm. but they don't get to spend much time together. You got Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift. Good movie. Great movie. You got something called Waist Deep. Never heard of Never heard movie. of that? Oh, oh, is that uh, a... Let's see. We got Tyrese. Tyrese vehicle. Yes. And the game, I believe, is in it. Megan Good. I remember that movie. Barely. Uh, Vondi Curtis Hall picture, director of Glitter. Oh, hey. Um, good actor. Good, great actor. Yeah. Uh, the Breakup... Uh, is in there the Da Vinci uh, Code? Break up a movie good. that I think is. Oh, that's Very a good, good movie. Peyton Reed's good. Yeah, good director. Uh, yeah, a lot of movies that I saw in college. Like that's uh, like what I think of when I think like, yeah. Break Up, Da Vinci Code, X Men Three, uh, X Men Three, Garfield: The Tale of Two Kitties. I didn't see that. Uh, I think I've seen that. Inconvenient oh, Truth. I didn't see that one. Hey, you know, he st- he he came out with the follow up. Garfield. Oh no! In- Inconvenient Truth. There's a new one. Yeah, an inconvenient sequel. <laughs> I thought there was a joke coming, but then there no, was. Well, yeah. I don't want to spoil the, the end of it, but I, I know what happened. You can spoil it. Spoiler alert. We're fucked. <laughs> All right. Well, that's the end of the box office game. Great. Uh, uh, it gets two Oscar nominations. It loses both of them. What did it lose costumes to? Or did it win costumes? No, it lost, right? I can, I can tell you. 2006. Might have been. Yeah, you want to pick? That's the year Departed wins Best Picture. So it uh, wasn't the Departed. Right. Uh, Series of Unfortunate Events was nominated but didn't win, right? No, it was not. I think it was nominated for production design. Okay. It's a good winner, actually. So the nominees are The Queen, another contemporary movie. Right. Queen doesn't win. Dream Girls. Right. So good. Devil Wears Prada. Dream Girls got crazy costumes. Curse of the Golden Flower. Yeah. Which is a wild nominee. Yeah. And then Marie Antoinette is the winner, which has very oh, elaborate that's a good costuming winner. by Melina Cananera. I will say, when, when I saw Dream Girls with Rom later this year, and Dream Girls has definitely faded in your heart more than Devil Wears Prada, which, is, which yeah. has stayed. I um, still listen to the soundtrack sometimes when I get ready. Nonstop. Morning. It's my number yeah. one karaoke go to. Listen. Um, but but uh, whatchamacallit, uh, after the end, I'm telling you, I'm not going number, when it's like, bum, 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 and it's like the big musical there, and the whole audience starts applauding. The second the music cut out, Rom turned to me. <laughs> what did I do? eight years old and her eyes are open wide and she goes this is the best movie I've ever seen in my entire life <laughs> you were like breathless like this is the best movie I've ever seen in my entire life uh, oh my God. I, I did that when uh, Donald Gleason goes to uh, to Russia to the countryside in Anna Karenina and they pull aside the curtain you said this is the best I movie turned to Joey seen. and I said this is the greatest movie I've ever seen isn't that a weird thing to do yeah that's yeah. a weird thing to do Sorry. especially right. when you're not eight yeah, I wasn't eight. I was like, you know, 24. Uh, Rom, uh, people people should follow you on social media. Not your Finsta account, not your fake account that I'm blocked from seeing. I, I, I'll, I'll re... Uh, I know, because here's the thing. I'm always like, oh, some of this stuff is really funny. Griffin will appreciate yeah. it. And then I start posting things and I'm like, I don't know if Griffin should know about this. But yeah. I mean, first is of all... Is this your private account? For, yeah, it's my uh, Finsta. Yes, yes. But, fake Instagram. Um, I've never heard of Finsta. I don't know what it's that is. It's such a thing. It's, it's, oh, it's, I'm, I'm so old. And yeah. But yes, I have a food blog, um, which I'm quite proud of. Maybe not as proud as my Finsta, but I'm, it's, it, it, it's up there. RomleyNewman.com is the place to go. It's a really smart name. Thought of it myself. And and it, your name on Twitter and Instagram, if you uh, want well, to follow you. Yeah, food by Romley? Food by, I don't really tweet, so I'm not even going to put that out there. But Food by Romley, if you like to see... Good food and yeah. both both uh, pictures of uh, food you eat and food you make. Right. I think you have a good balance of the two. Yes. Yes. Um, sometimes I feel like I need more clarification because I feel like people think I'm a better chef than I am because they think all the pictures. Oh, sure. Are, yeah. Sure. Sure. But, um, well, well, you know, you're not being dishonest. No, I, I put the. Lo- I never say I made this. Right. Right. So let, you're let curating. Assume. I'm curating. 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 Where to go and what to make. Yeah. Um. Yeah. 
Uh, yes, I did get a rare Romilly fave yesterday when I just tweeted Stanley Tucci. At well, Griffin. yeah, because I because I, I I was in the same boat. No, no, yeah. I mean I agree, Stanley yeah. Tucci. Um, Agreed. But the, yeah, but, but yes, I feel like you're not a big on Twitter. I'm not. You're not a, you're a Twitter lurker. Used to be bigger. Sure. I think you, you had your period like, where oh, you were into it. Love yeah. this cold pressed juice. Yeah. And now it's now people don't know if it. you like cold pressed no. juice or not. They have we'll no idea. Know. We'll never know. Uh, well, thank you so much for being here, Romilly. Thanks thank you for, for being on our me. dumb podcast, Romilly. It's so great. Yeah. Um, uh, have fun having Redditors discuss all of your opinions now. Oh, God. Oh, God. You get I forget how popular the... this is. Oh, so popular. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think we're the number one podcast, right? Uh, I yeah, think we, we just, recently became we just number one. The Throne Serial? Um, we're number one. Yeah, right. Serial is going to release a new uh, season about how great we are and how we beat their ass and like just dumped them in the garbage. Which is crazy because they were the first podcast. It was. It was no podcast, no podcast, no podcast. Serial. That's right. how it worked. Right. Do you remember that this started out as a as parody? As a serial parody? Yeah. 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 No, I remember. I will never forget. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. I remember that we had the serial music. I remember having to listen to it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I helped make that mashup. You're a good boy. I am a good boy. You're a real yeah. good boy, Benny. Yep. Uh, uh, so join us next week for Catherine Bigelow. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess we're breaking off a of Bigelow, right? Do we have a name? Uh, uh, zero pod casty. Zero pod thirty. Mm. Pod zero. Pado pado dark casty. The the pod lock cast. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, 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 P nineteen. The pod of casting. That's a. Yeah. yeah, Pod 19, the Widowcaster, or variations therein. I've seen that. Yeah. You know, K... Uh, mm. We'll have to figure something out. But, we're we're, uh, we're going to have to figure something out fast. Stay tuned for that. Strange series. podcasting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, stay tuned for that, whatever it's called. Yeah, it's going to be The fun. Loveless. Yeah, that's what... Yeah, next week we'll be discussing The Loveless. I'm available on Amazon Prime, last hey, I checked. great company. Willem Dafoe. Jeff Bezos did just lower the prices at uh, Whole Foods. I can get a cheap avocado. Oh, yeah, he did. Get myself a cheap avocado. Hell, yeah. Unfortunately, he also lowered my salary for season two of the day. (laughs) Oh, did he? He did. Are you announcing season two right now? Yeah, he said, (laughs) they said, we're going to cut down Whole Foods prices. Unfortunately, that money. They were like, good news and bad news. Good news and bad news. Number one, good news. Avocados, two bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey. Bosch got a raise, though. (laughs) So you and Bosch were in the same meeting? They, like, gathered all the stars? Yeah. Like, was Mozart in the jungle there? Yeah. Do you know that Titus Welliver collects action figures? No. I saw a video recently. Huh? Titus Welliver will be one of the guests on my new podcast, Toy Boys. Uh, you're not allowed to have another podcast. <laughs> you're not allowed to have another podcast until we are no longer week to week. Tune in next week for Toy Boys with special <laughs> guest Titus Welliver. Um, yeah, we should. Ma- yeah, no bonus episode of Nolan yet, we should say. Right? Uh, y- yeah. We it, might do one. It, it look. It scheduling's been scheduling's crazy. been really tough. But you might drag me to Six Flags at some point. Yeah, it just might be a delayed thing. But people will be happy whenever the fuck we do that. Nonsense. Right at that point, that might be more of like one of our DC episodes than specifically a Nolan episode. Sure, that sure, might be sure. a general kind of State of the Union DC miniseries check-in. <laughs> Great. We're doing this disjointed, <laughs> long-form wait. DC miniseries yes. spread across years. Yeah. Um, All right. Yeah, yeah, no. Good good job, everybody. Hopefully they'll announce a Joker movie by then. I'd really love to see a movie about the Joker. No, I, I don't think they they think that's bankable. Yeah. Uh, by the way, we're recording this in May of 2012. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Uh, check out uh, our subreddit for some real nerdy shit. Thanks to Ange for Gudo for our social media, Joe Bowen and Patrick Reynolds for our artwork, Liam Montgomery for our theme song. Romley, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And as always, just just a touch of the tooth. Just a touch? Just a a little. That's all you need. A little touch of the tooth.